Now, I know that this story may sound fictional. A lot of people don't believe me when I tell it, but I can assure you that the other persons involved also witnessed what occurred that strange night. So this happened 11 years ago with my ex-girlfriend. It actually changed our relationship for the worse, and we ended up breaking up a few weeks after this too. Nonetheless, I still remember this like it was yesterday due to how unexplainable it was. My girlfriend at the time wanted to surprise me with what she said was an overnight surprise trip. I obliged and felt like I was a pretty lucky guy for her to do something that required so much planning like that. After packing a duffel bag full of clothes and toiletries, we left for what I thought was a resort or some kind of hotel stay. Two and a half hours passed when we pulled off a main road and headed down an off-road path. So I asked her if this was a camping trip and she replied yes. To be honest, I was sort of disappointed as I didn't really like camping all that much and not to mention I wish that I knew to pack my hiking shoes and all that. But I didn't complain of course because it was still a romantic gesture. Fifteen minutes on this rough road we finally pulled into a camping ground. The first thing that I noticed was that there really wasn't anyone around us. It made sense though. This was really far off the beaten path. I was actually surprised her car made it that far out considering how harsh the road was to be honest. But anyway, we made a fire pit and she cooks dinner. Everything is going just fine and we're really feeling each other. Uh, we of course take it to the tent as the sun goes down and we're vibing off of each other and yeah, it's what you would expect would happen as we begin moving things along as young college age kids do. But this is where the first strange occurrence happens. I hear scratching noises on the side of the tent. I try to remember if we set the tent up next to brush or something. Maybe the wind is causing branches to rustle against the tent. And I mean, oh well, that's the woods, right? But maybe it's a bird or something else too. It stops rustling and we continue chilling as if nothing happened. But then things escalate in a really strange way. It's like the wind stopped and the environment just became perfectly silent. We both felt uneasy, causing us to get sort of knocked out of our playful mood, I guess you could say. She laid next to me as we tried to concentrate on listening to hear if there was a bear or some other animal in the area or something. But then it happened in an instant. Something akin to an explosion hit the tent tremendously hard. I could compare it to as if, say, maybe a log was thrown in like a, a battering ram against the side of the tent and... I say this because it literally pushed the material in forcefully and felt dangerous in fact. A surge of adrenaline lit through my body as I felt like something violent was outside the tent. I never knew if I was a flight or fight guy but I guess my next action gives me some idea and I yelled aloud, give me the knife and the flashlight as I scrambled up and unzipped the tent with tools in hand. My first thought was that I was going to confront some psycho that was messing with us perhaps with a, a baseball bat or some kind of battering weapon. But I kid you not, I launched myself out of that tent and stood up in a flurry to confront my attacker. A few breaths pass as a cold feeling sets in. I do a 360 scan to nothing. Nothing but silence and darkness. Maybe it was a, a branch that fell on the tent? But no... There was absolutely nothing on the ground where the thud was heard and felt. I yelled out hello again and again to no response until only a moment later in the silence, a chill shot up my spine. I get the keys and get out of the tent, I said in a frantic tone as my girlfriend listened and now joined me and I looked at a car that we arrived in and noticed that it was about 30 yards out by the shoddy off-road path. She didn't even need to know what I was thinking as we both just started to speed walk towards it. Now, you might be thinking at this point that I'm just overreacting, but truly, I cannot describe the terror that washed over me when I looked out in the darkness after investigating the tent that night. I could feel like something was watching me, and to top it off, it was eerily silent too. I know that she confirmed my suspicions too when she started for the car immediately without question. Our instincts were telling us to get the heck out of there quickly, and the walk to the car was really unnerving and felt like a football field away, but finally we get into the car with the keys in hand, and I took the driver's seat. After turning the keys led to some relief as the engine started. 
Instinctively, I locked the doors and turned the headlights on. We sat for about three seconds trying to rationalize what was happening when my girlfriend started exclaiming, My laptop is moving. Something is in the tent. She said this because she brought her laptop to serve as a lantern after dark. We of course left it in a hurry as well as other items. But I saw what she saw. It was items being rustled around 30 yards away. Without further hesitation, I put the car in gear and started down the rough road. As I tried to calmly drive the car down the dirt path, quickly but carefully, it was a very rough road and I didn't want to get stranded out there. The strangest thing happened next. A loud, piercing sort of ringing noise rang from inside the car's cabin. I turned the radio on and off. I checked the windows. I asked my girlfriend if her car had ever made such noises and she replied no. I asked her again if she could hear it as maybe it was just me being under stress and she said, yes, I hear it. I don't know what that is though. Now, I wanted to write this off as a car problem, but if you were in there with me, you would describe it as some kind of, I don't know, like bell continuously ringing. It didn't sound like any car noise that I had ever heard before, but my next instinct as I grew up as a pastor's kid, and my next instinct as I grew up as a pastor's kid... I just remember praying for 10 minutes as I was convinced that it was a supernatural or demonic event. We endured the screech for 10 grueling minutes as to my relief it ended suddenly and it didn't fade out or just go quiet either. The loud ring literally just stopped in an instant. I can't describe the feeling in that car when it stopped too. It is just so strange to look back and remember that I felt internally that the ordeal was over since the ring stopped. What I mean is that everything just felt normal again. The panic, the chills, all of that went away in an instant. We ended up down the road another 45 minutes away and finally stopped at a trucker diner. We slept in the parking lot, or at least she did, as I was still too on edge from the adrenaline dumping that I just went through. In attempted bravery the next day, we went back to the campsite as the sun was up. We investigated, but we saw no tracks or anything except for the contents of the tent tossed around, but still accounted for. I was hoping, sort of, I guess, that they were missing so that I could write it off as people screwing with us and plundering our tent, but that didn't seem to be the case. We were packed up and gone in less than 10 minutes as the area still felt really weird, but after that, I haven't been camping since. I would go again, but next time I'm going to go with an RV or at least a relatively known location with others around. This place was the remote mountains of Payson, Arizona, far from civilization, and it's one place that I won't be going again. This was a few years ago, but I thought that I would share it because to this day it's one of the scariest things that's ever happened to me. Basically, a few years ago, my sister lived in this house share. It was a huge house too, three stories with five bedrooms and two bathrooms. At the time, my sister was the only one living there, so all the other rooms were vacant. My sister's bedroom was on the ground floor next to the kitchen. And one night, I was staying there with her. She'd gone to bed a couple of hours ago, and I was suffering with insomnia at the time, so I was in the kitchen talking on the phone with a friend. It was about three in the morning. While I was on the phone, I just got this horrible, overwhelming feeling of being watched. It was like something, not someone, was in the room with me, and whatever it was did not want me there. I tried to ignore it, thinking that... I was just being silly and continued my conversation for a few minutes, but it got to a point where I straight up just did not feel safe in that room anymore. So I told my friend that I was going to bed and I hung up the phone. I went into my sister's room and she'd always told me to lock the door behind me, even when there was nobody else in the house. It was a standard lock that just had to be turned, so I did that and then I grabbed my blankets and I laid on the floor to sleep. I must have only laid there for maybe a minute or two when I heard the sound of the lock clicking and the door creaking open and suddenly that feeling of dread was back. It took me a minute but I finally built up the courage to turn around and check the door was wide open. While I was staring at the door I couldn't see anything but 
I could literally feel something there watching me just as I was frozen. I finally managed to reach my hand out to shake my sister awake and she had to get up and close and lock the door because I just physically couldn't move out of fear. I had a, a lot of experiences in that house but that by far was the scariest to me because quite honestly that night I felt like I was about to die. So my father and uncle have a story of living as outsiders or non-natives, Caucasian, young people on the reservation. Their tale was of experiencing a skinwalker. My grandma taught school on the reservation and they lived well off compared to the natives living there. But from what I know, there's a lot of law surrounding the Navajo Nation. Non-natives, primarily older generations, keeping their experiences and stories left unspoken especially to those not from the culture. Forgive me too if I'm mistaken in any of this, the culture, ideology, practices, or any other part. I'm just trying to tell the story that my family has only spoken to me in whispers about. My grandmother, father, and uncle lived there for a few years, and their experience was much different than the Navajo people who lived there for generations upon generations. And I just want to tell their story and get insight as to anyone else who has lived in that community and any other story some people might be willing to share. So, my father and uncle are about two years apart in age. They lived in Navajo Mountain in the 1980s. My dad was 10 to 12 and my uncle younger. And as it goes, they were always outside riding bikes with their friends, natives of the reservation. My grandma was recovering from an abusive relationship with their father and wasn't too concerned with their whereabouts, being it was a small community. There wasn't much trouble around, nor would they know what real trouble was at that age. Trouble wasn't the issue to young white boys in a reservation then, but pure terror was. It was a typical night, without any parental supervision. The night was colder than usual, and the night sky was blacker than you could imagine. In such a desolate place, the stars in the sky would light the night, but this night was as if the earth had moved to a different dimension, an abyss even. The boys raced each other as they did every night, until they were compelled to force their brakes in unison. They simultaneously looked up, each boy's face melted from carefree innocent and adolescent to unadulterated horror. The boys stood motionless, grasping their bikes with every nerve, muscle and strength in their body on the dirt road, because to the right of them was a mesa, one that they rode by every day, the mesa that paralleled from my family's home. The mesa that they could see through my father and uncle's bedroom every night. This mesa would become fear and nightmare to them from this night forward. Because at the top of the mesa was a roaring fire, taller than any bonfire that someone could assemble, bigger than a group of people could assemble. It raged and was unbelievable. It was almost as tall as the mesa itself. More unbelievable though was the pitch black figure seen cavorting around the bonfire the native boys with my father and uncle informed them that this was not a typical Navajo dance or ritual either. Pits began to form in their stomachs. Friends of my father and uncle turned back around without a word and bolted back to their homes. My father and uncle threw their bikes to the ground and ran across the unpaved road into their home. The two came back in a panic, relaying what they'd seen to my grandmother, but she was unconcerned for the most part. It was apparently a legend of the natives, she told them, and shooed them away. They laid awake all night in their shared room that night, not saying a word to one another. They forced their curtains to close as much as they could, too scared to look out the window and see what they shouldn't have to begin with. Neither could shake the images burnt into their memory, but the sun managed to rise and peek through into their entire room eventually. A sense of release washed over them as the darkness had faded. The boys left their beds and they traveled to the kitchen to try a second time to tell the grandmother what they saw that night. They tried to get a handle on what they saw, but it was as if they couldn't explain it. Again, my grandmother brushed them off, but with the coffee and newspaper more important than their story, she told them to climb the mesa to investigate. So the boys wrangled their friends who shared the experience with them that night prior as they passed on their bikes. 
The friends stayed on the dirt road, looking up at the mesa as my father and uncle climbed up to see any evidence of the hell-burning fire they witnessed together. The mesa wasn't much taller than an average one-story house, though, so the brothers took less than two minutes to climb to the top where the nightmare took place. When they got to the top, they were hysterical and also relieved. There was no indication a bonfire of that enormity, or even a fire at all, had taken place on the mesa they had already seen in the night earlier. They climbed down and told the message to the friends who had also been a part of the shocking scene. The native friends looked at them in shock, but neither said a word to them. They immediately turned their bikes around and proceeded home, and it was never talked about again despite my father and brother asking about it. My grandmother and everybody else in the community just refused to talk about it again. My father is a skeptic. He doesn't believe in anything paranormal like aliens, ghosts, mermaids, I mean, you name it. But whenever I ask about the skinwalker he saw, he always turns pale and white. He gets quiet, jumpy and curt. I had to plead to get the full story out of him, in fact, and I could see goosebumps and every hair standing up on his arms when he shared this experience. My grandma took me to Navajo Mountain in 2019 to show me her history and see how Navajo natives still live on this reservation today. According to her, not much has changed since living there in the 80s too. I hiked and explored what I could of the reservation as to not invade or violate any of the Navajo reservation and its beauty. However, I did feel a change in mood when I visited. My existence felt, I don't know, heavy as if I wasn't supposed to be there or as if I was invading on territory that wasn't meant for me. Not caused by any of the community there or anything, but just by my presence being on the land or something. I will never forget my experience visiting and all that I learned about the reservation life. I climbed the mesa where the skinwalker my dad and uncle had seen its ritual and I felt pretty normal until I got to the top and stood in the middle. I know it sounds weird, but... I felt a, a darkness creep into me as I stood there, and ever since then, I've never been the same. So my cat likes to go outside every day, in the morning. He follows us to the door, takes the elevator down with us, and then goes about his day outside until we bring him back home again in the evening. Now, my cat isn't the most punctual guy, so it's pretty common for him to stay much later in the neighborhood, sometimes well into the night for like several days even, or he gets bored and doesn't play for more than two hours and wants to get back inside. The problem is that we're not home, so he just has to wait. My family and I lived in an apartment on the first floor, so my cat's solution is to sit under one of the balconies and meow at the top of his lungs to get our attention. When we're home, it works perfectly fine, but when we're not, it's a lot less effective. So our solution was to gently ask our neighbors that have the key to our apartment to bring him up so he doesn't have to wait outside all day. Those that don't have the key sometimes let him inside the building so he's not literally outside. For example, when it's raining. Our apartment is a bit special though because it's bigger than the others, so to get inside there are two ways when you get into the main hall. One takes the stairs to the left and open the door that has two locks. The second uses the elevator with the special key that goes directly inside of our apartment and the door only has one lock. The cat is actually used to the second option and me too because we're both lazy. But when the neighbors that don't have the key let him inside the building, he goes up the stairs and waits. And since I usually use the elevator from the parking two floors below, that means that I don't really see him waiting in the hall and he meows outside the door to get me to open it up for him, or my dad, or my mum. But all around we have our habits with my parents and neighbors and it works fairly well. So, now that you know how everything goes with the little guy, now we get to the good part. But my parents like the outdoors very much, so I'm usually left alone in the weekends. But generally, it means just taking care of chores and inviting my friends over so that we can have the apartment to ourselves, which is pretty nice. But this time, I was alone. It was late, 11 p.m.-ish, and I was just chilling in the living room before hearing meowing over the sound of the TV. 
Someone must have let my cat in the building, and he's waiting outside the door like usual. I took my keys and started opening the first lock. I don't know about other pet owners, but I know my cat meows by heart pretty much. It's kind of a, a rising meow that's very high-pitched and very cute, and that also has a specific sort of rhythm to it because I've been hearing it nearly every day for like five years. And because of this, I stopped. You see, the noise isn't what it usually is. It's like too deep and just off a bit. But this isn't my cat outside my door, and he's the only cat around that knows that he has to wait by the door and scream to be let inside. By that point, I had stopped halfway through opening the door and waited to hear him again and noticed scratching this time. But my cat never scratches the door. At that point, I'm a bit weirded out by the situation, but the meowing is getting super loud and I didn't want the neighbors to be woken up, so I continued with my key, but suddenly I heard another noise that really freaked me out. It was a cough. For the record too, I'm not a very cautious person and in my whole 21 years of living in this apartment, I must have looked in the peephole a total of maybe, I don't know, five times, but a small part of my brain told me to do it and thank God that I did it that night. So I let go of my keys and put my eye against the door and I saw it, a man standing there meowing at my front door. To say that I was terrified is really an understatement, but my heart pretty much stopped. I just stood there petrified for what felt like an hour. I don't really know how long it took for me to move again, but eventually my body just took over, I guess. And I did what you'd expect. I ran for my phone, stood in the corner of the living room, and called the police. By the time that they got there, there was nobody in the front door. I can't even remember when the meowing stopped, to be honest, and... They just took my testimony before telling me to be cautious and left. To this day, I still don't know what that meowing guy wanted. I'm not sure I want to know anyway, but I also don't know how he got inside the building in the first place since you need a key to access it and how he knows that I would open the door if he imitated my cat in front of it. Well, at least I'll be careful from now on, I suppose, and that's good, but... Oh, and my cat eventually came back in since then, and he's sleeping in my bed as I'm sharing this, so <laughs> there's that, I guess. So I dated someone who owned a cadaver dog. Basically, they can find dead bodies. It was a new term to me when I met them, too. But anyways, they explained that they worked with rescue teams. We live in wilderness country. The dog's job was to sniff out bodies for people who might have gotten lost and died, buried under avalanches, etc. After five months of dating to my now ex asked if I could house or dog sit. I was more than happy to because it was a great dog. I would be dog sitting for two weeks while they visited family. I was warned that it has happened on hikes before that the dog picks up the scent of a corpse and gave me the steps to follow if it does happen and the first couple of days were pretty uneventful. But then one day, the dog is dragging me down this trail, and I'm panicking because I was like, oh no, I'm going to see a dead body, aren't I? But the dog stops at this very stern woman, just sort of sauntering along. He keeps looking back and forth between me and the woman. She gives me a quick, your dog isn't well trained, and keeps going. I practically had to drag this dog away to get it away from this woman. And it happens with this same woman a few more times, so I call the owner to bring it up. I describe the woman, and my ex is so shocked and confused by this, not familiar with this woman at all. But fast forward to my last night of dog sitting. I was going to bed, and I had this horrific nightmare of being held down in the bed by this woman. I hear a bark, and I wake up, and the dog is standing next to me on the bed. It's also in its alert position, staring at the bed. And after that, I didn't get any sleep. And I also never got any answers. This happened about 15 years ago. I was 21 years old and living in my first apartment. It was a small bachelor apartment in a pretty sketchy area. 
I grew up in a town that was known to be rough and tough, I guess you could say. I knew how to handle myself and learned at a young age to keep my head down and not to go looking for trouble. My apartment building was behind a bar as well. A lot of the customers of the bar would stand outside to smoke. And when they stood outside to smoke, they would be looking at my apartment pretty much all the time. Most of the people who were out smoking kept to themselves. A few would nod and say hello if I passed by. Never any issues. Well, at least until one evening. One evening I came home from work. I passed the bar like I always did and saw this extremely tall man outside smoking. As I passed, he stared at me. I gave him a slight nod, but he didn't acknowledge me. He just continued to stare and it made me uncomfortable for sure, but I didn't think too much of it. Anyway, about an hour later, I hear a knock on my door and it was odd because you have to buzz people into the building here. The building only had eight units and I didn't really know any of the neighbors. So I froze because I really didn't want to talk to anyone, but the knocking continued and so I finally shouted out, who is it? But there was no response. I shouted again, who's there? And the voice said, it's Tom. Now... I didn't know anyone named Tom, so I shouted back, I don't know anyone named Tom, you must have the wrong apartment. The voice said, you may not know me, but I know you, open up so that we can talk. I went over to the peephole and sure enough, it was that tall dude from the bar. So I loudly said, get out of here or I'm calling the cops. I heard his footsteps walk away and I heard the building door open and then close and he was gone. Or well, so I thought, because a few minutes later, I peeked out the window and he was standing in the parking lot. He seemed to be talking to himself or something. At this point, obviously I'm freaking out. I called my landlord who lived in the building next to me. He told me to call the police and that in the meantime, him and his brother would come and check things out. I call the police and tell them what's going on. They said that a car is on the way. Meanwhile, my landlord and his brother make their way to the parking lot. I watch out of my window and see them approach the tall dude. The tall dude takes one look at them and he just bolts. Well, my landlord and his brother try to chase him, but the tall dude got away. About five minutes later, the police arrive. I give my version of the events and also a description of this guy. And the officer just sort of stares at me and then says... We've had reports of a man matching that description who has been sexually assaulting women. Thank God you didn't open the door. A few days later, I get a call from the officer. He told me part of their investigation was talking to the owner of the bar and the owner called the police when Tall Dude reappeared after a few days and the police responded and they arrested him. Turns out, he was that guy. I live in Florida and this incident happened about three weeks after Hurricane Irma, so a little while ago now. Back in July, the ex and I had just finalized the divorce and I moved into a gated neighborhood where every house was rented out by the same rental company or landlords. It's a very small neighborhood with about 15 houses tops. All 15 houses are bordered around a man-made lake with the backyards facing the lake. No one really has a fenced backyard too. When you walk out of your back door, you see the lake in front of you and your neighbor's backyards on each side of you. Everyone in the neighborhood seemed very close. Someone was always hosting a family-friendly party or barbecue or having people over to watch sports or something like that. I was and am still depressed about my divorce, so I never partook in these social gatherings. The only person that I got to know was my next-door neighbor, Steve, an active Navy soldier with a huge love for guns. Steve is the true hero in this nightmare too. My daughter, Alice, is four years old and I got her every weekend. Alice's bedroom window faces the backyard towards the lake. I spoil that girl to death too. She truly is my everything and I count down the days to the weekend every week just to be with her. But that's why I was upset when Irma came and I had to go almost three weekends without seeing her. The weekend before the storm, she was with her mum. Then obviously the weekend of the storm, she was also with her mum. Then on top of that, the weekend after, she had to be with her mum because my power was still out. No AC in Florida is miserable, let me tell you. 
The humidity was so bad that week that I ended up sleeping in my daughter's room the whole week because she has the only room with a window that faced the lake. I opened the window, exposing just the window screen, so the window from the lake could cool the room as much as possible while I slept. Eventually, the power comes back and Alice starts visiting me again like normal. And that was when the nightmare started. My daughter would complain about the singing lady and how she doesn't like her anymore. I thought that maybe she was referring to one of my ex's friends or one of the teachers at her school. Maybe there was a teacher at her school that sang to the kids that she didn't like. That Saturday night though, Alice woke up in the middle of the night screaming like I've never heard. I ran into her room and turned on the light and found her hiding under her covers. I asked her what was wrong and all she could do was point to an empty corner of her room and say, Look, look. But there was nothing there. She was acting as if she saw a ghost. After I calmed her down, she started to talk about the singing lady again. Please tell the singing lady not to come back. Please, daddy, make her go away. Obviously, she was having nightmares, right? I showed her that there was nothing in the closet and nothing under the bed and that there was nothing to be afraid of. She calmed down and went back to sleep. I went back to my room and quickly fell back to sleep too. And it couldn't have been more than 20 minutes before Alice comes running into my room screaming, She's back! She's back! Alice absolutely refused to go back to her room too, so I let her sleep with me. The next morning, Sunday morning, I took Alice out to breakfast and we stopped by Target to pick up a baby monitor. I haven't used one since her mum and I were still married, but... I wanted to easily be able to hear her if or when she started having any of these nightmares again so I could respond quicker. After I set them up, I showed Alice how they worked to give her assurance that I could hear her and she was safe. And that night she slept soundly and didn't make her peep all night. The following weekend, Alice had to stay with her mother again because she caught a stomach virus from one of her little friends at school. It was Saturday night and I was sound asleep in my bed. It was around 2 a.m. when I heard it. A woman's voice humming a, a soft nursery rhyme through the baby monitor. The humming and the soft singing got louder and clearer as the voice got closer to the monitor. I wasn't dreaming too. I mean, I could hear a woman softly singing lullabies in my daughter's bedroom. I had never been so scared and dumbfounded in my life. I was feeling a mixture of pure terror and just disbelief. Then the voice spoke out, Alice, sweetie, are you awake? Adrenaline shot through my veins. I jumped out of bed and locked my bedroom door. I picked up my cell and I called Steve from next door. He didn't waste a second too. As soon as I got off the phone with him, I heard him storm out of his back door screaming, Don't you move! I ran outside and found him aiming a shotgun at a woman crouched outside of my daughter's window. The one that I had left open after Irma and never closed. Steve quickly dropped his guard when he recognized the woman. It was Jean, the neighborhood maintenance woman. Steve's wife came running out after him and confirmed that it was her. Jean played dumb, said that she was not singing and didn't even know my daughter's name. She said that she was near my daughter's window because she was doing a weekly patrol for gators and thought that one approached our house from the lake or something. That was bull though. She was singing, and she called out to my daughter by name. Yes, it's true that there have been a few gator spottings around the neighborhood, and yes, part of Jean's job was to patrol the lake at night every now and then, but at 2 a.m.? I obviously knew that it was bull, and even though neither Steve or his wife called her out on it, I could tell from the look on their faces that they didn't believe her either. The next morning, I went over to Steve's house to thank him and tell him exactly what happened. He told me that Jean and her husband have been known to be in a, a little cuckoo, but this was by far the craziest thing to happen so far. And Steve, the absolute saint, helped me install metal bars on Alice's window that afternoon. I live in a city located in a valley with a lot of smaller towns up the hills and mountains around. So it's part of the local culture for teenagers and young adults to visit these smaller areas during the winter to drink, smoke, and hang out with their friends. My uncle bought a house in one of these areas, so eventually I decided to get the keys and spend a weekend there 
with five of my friends. The house has two big bedrooms and three beds each and a lot of extra mattresses as well. At night, we decided at some point to go back inside and just chill and watch TV, but since the living room had no sofas yet, we brought some mattresses from the bedrooms and just used them. One of my friends, Victor, decided to go out for a smoke and after some minutes we hear someone knocking at the window just behind us. Everyone got a bit scared for a second but just looked at the window and said things like, oh, it's just Victor. But since we were sitting on mattresses close to the ground, it wasn't easy to see clearly who was at the window and since the person just stood there looking straight at one of the girls, I got up and checked. I saw a man who somehow looked a lot like my friend but... A bit more fat and older than him, I guess. As I came to the conclusion that it was a stranger, I froze while looking at him and him looking back at me when I said, That's not Victor. Everybody else froze too and looked at me waiting for a reaction, but all I could think was to ask what he wanted. He just stood there for a second and asked, There's a bar nearby and we need a drummer to play with our band. Is any of your friends a drummer by any chance? which weirdly enough I am but I just told him no and after some extra long seconds looking at us he left. My friend came back and we made fun of the situation making jokes on how it was him messing with us etc. Later most of the group decided to sleep in one bedroom and leave the second for me and one of the girls since they saw us kissing earlier. We all go to bed but some hours later I wake up to the girl shaking me in horror and whispering that she heard something coming from the kitchen. So I get up, tell her to lock the bedroom when I leave and go check the sound like the moron who always dies first in the films. And as I pass by the second bedroom, I think about calling someone else to join me but as soon as I see them all sleeping, I hear something in the kitchen's window. I quickly move there in silence, check around and as soon as I find one, I grab a knife. The door opens right in front of me at this point and it was that same guy. I knew it was no joke since I just saw my friend sleeping. It probably took like 5-10 to 10 seconds of just staring at each other, but it felt like an eternity. While still holding the door handle, he made a slow movement with the other hand towards something under his shirt, which was probably a gun or a knife, but I also lifted my hand showing him the knife, so he stopped. The kitchen was quite small though, so we were standing pretty close to each other and at this point, we both knew it would end bad for both of us if he tried something, so I just shook my head and said as calm as I could, don't. He just kept staring at me a bit more and then finally closed the door and eventually went away. I went back and told the girl that it was nothing and that we should just go back to bed. I didn't sleep that night and we left early in the morning and I made sure to ask my uncle and cousins if they ever received weird visits there. They said that the only person who ever goes there at night is the old neighbor when his wife doesn't let him arrive drunk at home. So he grabs my uncle's rocking chair to sleep until he gets sober. And obviously that was not this guy. Now every year my friends talk about spending another weekend there but... I always make an excuse so we never go through that again and they never know what happened. It finally started raining here so I took my 14 month old mushroom hunting over the weekend. It was later than we normally go and the sun goes down much earlier but we were taking a quick trail to the river and back in hopes to finding something. We took a wrong turn and we ended up going through a big field which the trail would take us back around to the main trail to the river. As we walked toward the main trail, the last group of people had left and it was just me and my son. We walked along and out of a thicket side trail came this weird man. He had a dog with him that was alert at his side. He was staring at us as we walked closer towards him. Then he started waving at us this really weird sort of slow wave. I was immediately uncomfortable and goosebumpy but didn't want to be impolite so I half-heartedly sort of waved back while staring back and telling my son to slow up a little. I didn't want to actually meet up at the junction. After a full minute of us dawdling the guy slowly turned and began walking down the trail toward the main trail. I was wary walking, didn't want to go too fast. 
and we stopped to look at some plants, so the guy and the dog got a bit further down this trail which curved to the right and continued on two blocks to the junction. I was thinking, if this is a creepy experience, this dude will be waiting around the corner for sure. And, sure enough, he was standing at the junction, off to the left and toward the parking lot, and to the right was a .6 trail to the river. But the dude was just standing there with his dog staring at us, not moving an inch. Both my son and I were like, holy heck, what the heck is this guy doing? Well, let's keep wide to the right and saying that he looks old. We could run faster than him and just generally planning for freaky deaky just in case. He kept staring at us as we approached. I asked if he was okay and kept staring back and he was greasy haired, tiny round glasses, a blue windbreaker, played long shorts, about 50 years old. His dog was a small beagle mix. He didn't answer me at all, just sort of kept staring and we turned to the right and walked about maybe a block. I had my phone cam facing me so I could catch him over my shoulder and the only movement was him slowly shifting his direction to continue staring at us. It was weird and I had these real predatory vibes watching him do this. It was moderately unsettling his stare and made more so by his lack of response, emotionless face, weird tiny glasses slow wave at us like a zombie but he did leave because on our way back he was no longer standing on the main trail when we got there it was a strange experience and something told me that this guy was up to no good So I, a 20 year old female, live with two other women but our boyfriends stay over frequently. I was outside with my parents and boyfriend handing out candy to some trick or treaters when I see my neighbour come outside. When we moved in, we quickly met the surrounding neighbours and these two lived directly across the street. Turns out too that the guy was an addict and the wife had a medical condition so she stayed inside a lot. The husband approached me though and my family and was generally pleasant to talk to before it turned incredibly uncomfortable. After about 30 minutes of speaking, he just wouldn't leave. He began to accuse me and my roommates of throwing out garbage in his garbage can or something. He then went into detail about how he had it on camera and there was a pair of underwear in the garbage bag. He described the person on these cameras as short and stout. I'm 5'10 and you'll see why I'm saying this. He continues to go on about how his wife is mad at him because one of us did it but he isn't mad and isn't trying to get us in trouble. And after about 15 minutes of this, his wife sends him a photo of my Facebook profile and says that this person's name was on the papers in the garbage. At this point, my parents went in and my boyfriend and I are alone with this man and he's saying that I must have done it and kept asking why I put these underwear on top but... Uh, my roommates and I have never thrown anything in his trash. I found their Facebooks and blocked them because it creeped me out and he said that his wife tried to call the police about it apparently. My parents sort of brushed it off but I don't know, I feel a bit uneasy about this. What do you guys make of this? When I was nine years old, two of my sisters and I were nearly kidnapped. We were visiting a paternal uncle in a small rural town in the US. My sisters, aged eight and six, and I, we had walked a block or two to an elementary school to play in the playground. To give some context to, this was around 1979, in summer, and the playground was near the street in a parking lot for the school. So... A man drove into the parking lot, got out of his car and came up to us. I was immediately leery. He started talking to us. As far as I recall, we were never taught stranger danger prior to this. In fact, we were told to always be polite to strangers. And this man, he kept trying to convince at least one, if not all three of us, to leave with him. It was very clear with him that this was not happening. I was trying to find an excuse for us to head home as well. He offered something to eat. I responded that my mum was making lunch. I remember him talking about either finding or playing with this dog or something. While he talked to us, I memorized every detail that I could. I also kept telling my sisters we needed to go. 
They wanted to play, but finally the fire department bell went off. They sounded it at noon every day, so I told my sisters mum was expecting us at home at noon for lunch. I took them both by the hand and we ran home. Before we went even a few steps though, the man called, If you're hungry, I can show you my hot dog. And I immediately responded, That's okay, I think my mum is making hot dogs for lunch. I remember thinking, chew on that, but when we got to my uncle's house, my mum was in the kitchen making lunch. Ironically, she was making us hot dogs too. I tried to tell her mum about what happened and she just wasn't listening. I finally said, Mum, the man wanted to show us his hot dog. That was when she started to listen to me. I told her everything and she called for my dad and my uncle. I was asked to retell the story and my father then called the cops. The police officers sat us all down, my uncle, parents and all three of us girls. I told the story again. My sisters and I were asked some questions. It seemed like the two of them hadn't seen the danger. The police officers then asked me to describe the man in his car and I was able to do so in great detail. The officers were actually surprised at how much detail I gave them. The officers told us that they would try to find him but pointed out that there was a large road that passed by this little town only a few blocks further down the road. My parents hadn't considered that when allowing us to play there. We came into town from another direction when visiting. We never heard from the police about this event and we were never allowed to go to the school playground on our own ever again. This happened when I was young, maybe 8 to 10 years old. I remember it perfectly but have confirmed the details with my mother and the memory of it sends chills down both of our spines to this day. So... It was broad daylight on a Saturday, and I was in the town centre with my mother. The streets were busy and the people bustled past. We paused at a shop front that sold ornaments, the ugly old-fashioned kind that old grannies like. We'd often stop to look at them and laugh at how expensive they were, wondering how that place even stayed open. I was a real chatterbox as a kid though and was talking animatedly to my mother about something or other, facing her as I did so. And like it was yesterday, I remember her smiling face and how it suddenly dropped. Her jaw hung opened and her eyes were as big as a dinner plate. She just stared at me silently for a few seconds and then grabbed my arm hard and pulled me away. Her fingers were digging into my arm as she dragged me into the crowd, walking as fast as she could without running. Being that kid, I squealed and loudly kept saying, What are you doing? Ow, mum. You're hurting me. That hurts. Where are we going? While trying to stop. She gritted her teeth though and silently dragged me for about three streets before stopping somewhere less busy for a second. It was only then too that she let go of my arm, rubbing it and looking extremely upset. Looking me dead in the eye, she explained that as I was talking outside the shop, she had noticed an old man stood behind me. He was dirty and disheveled, like the horror movie stereotype of a creepy old man. I had long pretty hair as a little girl and people stopped us all the time to remark on it, especially when I wore it loose. And this old man had very gently lifted a handful of my hair in his hand and was smelling it, tickling his nose as he did so. I was clearly so absorbed in telling my story, I hadn't even realized that I was being touched. My mother made eye contact with the man as he opened his eyes while inhaling the smell of my hair. He gave her an absolute nauseating toothy grin quickly dropping my hair and waving at her, or wagging his fingers all cutesy-like. Whoopsie, you caught me was the sort of vibe that he gave, clearly knowing exactly what he did. He then disappeared into the throng of the people moving past. My poor mother immediately felt sick and just went into autopilot, dragging me away as fast as she could in the opposite direction. I didn't even know how to react when she told me what happened, except to be horrified and so glad that we had gotten away safely. I still walk past that shop and the memory of my mother's haunted expression always makes me feel ill when I think about it. So first of all, English is not my first language so I apologize for any mistakes in advance. But here's the deal. For a long time in my family, we've seen my mum in places where she physically could not be. Like one day... 
I was with my sister watching TV and my mum was at work. Then the front door opened and my mum appeared, showing only the top half of her body, bending over so that her waist and legs were out. She seemed sort of, I don't know, distracted, turned her head in all directions and then asked for my other sister. There are three of us. We told her that she was in her room. My mum said, oh, okay, thanks, and came out. But it was super weird. But then, a few hours later, she got off work, came home, and we asked her about what happened earlier, and she said that she was apparently at work all day. I want to clarify, too, that my mum is a very serious woman. She doesn't make jokes, and she doesn't lie about stuff like this. So that was obviously super creepy. Other days, we would hear her calling us, and then when we go to her room or the kitchen, we find out that she's not even in the house. But the creepiest thing happened before I was born. My mother was at home at about 9pm watching TV and her sister was washing dishes in the front of the window. Then my mother heard her sister calling, Sarah, it's late, come into the house. Then my mum replied that she was already in the house. But her sister didn't hear her. She kept calling my mum because she was apparently watching her through the window playing outside in the garden. Then my mum shouted that she was already in the house her sister turned her head towards her, and then she turned her head towards the window, and right in front of the window was a copy of my mother, as a child obviously, only she looked pale and sort of haggard, and very thin. My mother and her sister swear that this was real and that the girl even smiled at them from outside the window. They both ran to their room, and they stayed there all night, being unable to sleep. Coupled with the events that we ourselves have experienced in my home, I really have nothing left to do but believe her as well. I've even seen my mum at night walk through our rooms and leave without saying anything, and she's not a sleepwalker. As a bonus too, my mother was born in a very small town in Mexico. Apparently there are testimonies of apparitions and supernatural things that are there all day long, and since her childhood she's always experienced supernatural things that are not at all pleasant. Anyway, I'd love to hear what your opinions are and if there's anything that we can do about this. I rented a house with three other roommates. After moving in, everything was fine for a while until two of them went out of town. My one roommate and I were in the basement watching movies and decided to sleep on the couches since it was the first night everyone wasn't in the house when from right above us, in the upstairs living room, we heard an incredibly loud dragging sound as if someone dragged our kitchen table across the floor, and so we were convinced that somebody was upstairs. We thought maybe one of our roommates came back or something, so we decided to go up and check it out, but when we did, there was nothing. The doors were locked, nothing had been moved, no roommates anywhere, this continued for the next couple of days too, getting worse and worse and only ever occurring at night. We also heard sounds like someone was running up and down the stairs, which was freaky, let me tell you. One night too, we went and checked out all the rooms, just to be sure. After turning off all the lights and closing the doors, we checked underneath to make sure all the lights were off too. We heard the sounds again and when we went back upstairs, the spare room light was on this time. We tried to tell ourselves that it must just be only the house making noises, but once our roommates got back, it never happened again. But things got worse. One night, I woke up to someone banging on my room door. I open it, and nobody's there. I talked to my roommates the next day, and they were all sleeping, apparently. We've all had friends over who have heard the sounds of someone running up and down the stairs, too. All my roommates also experienced waking up in the middle of the night sensing something watching them. It was creepy to say the least. But the scariest thing though that I ever experienced was one night when I got up to use the washroom and when I went to open the door I had a very intrusive thought that said, if you open this door you'll die, just wait. I don't know why but I had an overwhelming feeling of dread and then it like passes like nothing happened as if whatever this was was just gone. I've never had an intrusive thought like that before. The weirdest part though was after most of my roommates moved out and others replaced them, one of them told me they experienced the exact same thing. 
I never told the new roommates about any details of the strange things that happened there. Just that weird things do happen because, I don't know, I didn't want to scare them but thought that they should know. Sometimes the presence would feel very threatening though, and other times it was really chill. There was a lot more that happened, but I don't want to make this story too long. Oh, and uh, we also got the house checked for carbon monoxide, and it was fine. Anyway, I would love it if anyone has some sort of explanation for all of this, or if they've had similar experiences. Since I moved out, I haven't heard anything strange happen, but have at places that I've lived prior to, so I don't know if it's just me, or maybe it was that house. I want to share something that happened to me when I was really little. My grandma was sick and my parents left me and my sister in our house to go see her. I was five years old, a girl, and my sister was seven, I believe. We were told to go to sleep, which we did. When it was already pretty late, though, I'm pretty sure way after midnight, I heard meowing outside of our house. I didn't think anything of it, didn't ask my sister, I just went ahead to the front door and opened it. When I did, there were four men outside and they looked at me. And I remember to this day one of them had this evil smile. Just by instinct too, I understood that I was in very, very big trouble. And probably within a few seconds, even though it felt like forever, I closed the door and was able to lock it just in time. They went to grab the doorknob but didn't catch it. It just happened so quickly and somehow I fluked it. They started trying to break the door, screaming and cursing, hitting it with feet, shoulders, and who knows what. But my sister woke up at this point, and we were terrified. She came to me and told me to go under the bed, because if they break in, they won't know that we're home, and maybe they won't find us. I was too scared to tell her what I did, and that they know that I'm here. I remember being under the bed for a very long time, and eventually, those people must have left. I don't know why and after how long, but we fell asleep and stayed under the bed till the morning time when my parents came back and saw the door all damaged and my sister told them that someone tried to break in. I never did tell anyone what I did that night. I guess I'm just so scared and I panic to this day when I look back at it that I never said anything. I could have been the reason though for my sister and me being killed that night. And I still get completely horrified when... I think about that night. This all happened when I was six years old and I still remember it so vividly. Just to preface this too, I'm open to the idea of the paranormal but for the most part I'm still a bit of a skeptic. I'm one of those I wouldn't be surprised if ghosts really existed but for now I don't think that they do sort of people. I believe that there's an explanation for pretty much any paranormal experience that we face, whether it's simple or complicated. So, my parents had immigrated from Vietnam in the 80s and did the whole Ellis Island immigration process. They've lived all over the country, but fast forward to 1993 where they had me in California. In 1999, my family was pretty poor and decided that we wanted to try and get a place with my cousin's family, my dad's brother's family. They went searching for a house in Sacramento, California. They found a place that was oddly cheap. If I can recall correctly too, it was a five bedroom, three bathroom house with a gated automatic fence. This was really fancy back then too, and it was a decently sized lot. Now, here are the details that were told to me later in life when I got older and spoke to my parents about the house. And there was obviously a catch to the low price point to this house and the offering price was due to the fact that it was known to be haunted. The real estate agent was very upfront about this too and mentioned the history of the house. The original owner of this home died in the nursery of the house. The nursery was located underneath the stairs, I think sort of Harry Potter cupboard style, but much bigger and is actually a room. We're unsure of what the owner died from, but my parents didn't think that this was necessary to know or even remember. My dad and his brother were skeptics at the time and were only interested in the price point really. The real estate agent mentioned that there have been many families that have lived here that experienced paranormal activity and moved out fairly quickly. But this 
this didn't stop them from taking the offer. There were many things that we experienced in this house. Some very typical, such as creaky pipes or wood, extreme sudden cold temps, footsteps, stuff like that. However, I'd like to just share what I deem to be, well, the creepiest moments. Although it was a five bedroom house, we had to share rooms due to two families living in this house. I shared a room with two of my cousins, both around my age, and one of the nights I remembered, this was a couple of weeks living here and we were already experiencing creepy things, I really needed a drink of water. We had a pact that if we ever went somewhere in the middle of the night, we would wake each other up and go together. So I woke up my cousins and told them to come with me to get a drink of water really quick. We had an uncle that stayed with us at that time too. He's that uncle that goes from family to family to squat for as long as he can and he still does this to this day. He would stay anywhere he possibly could pretty much. And well, he didn't mind taking the nursery. Obviously, when we were kids, our parents didn't inform us of any of the paranormal talk that they had. All of our experiences were discovered on our own pretty much. So, as we walked down the stairs, we could hear our uncle groaning in his sleep, almost as though he was in pain. Well, we sat on the stairs and continued to listen, and we were trying to make out what he was trying to say. We noticed that the name Sam kept coming up, so we got our water and we just went back to sleep. The next day we brought up what we heard our uncle said to our parents and told them that he kept saying the name Sam. My parents sort of looked at us in terror, then they tried to play it off and said that it was nothing to be concerned about. And I mean, we were kids, but we definitely knew that they were hiding something from us. But we pretty much just moved on from it. When we were older though and talked about this incident, our parents finally told us the truth about that time. My parents told me and my siblings and I eventually told my cousins who had already been told by their parents as well. But apparently, Sam is the name of the original owner that passed away in that nursery. They had not at all informed my uncle about the name of the owner. They confronted my uncle in fact and he had no idea what they were talking about. This sent chills up my spine, even so many years after the experience. But here is the last experience that was pretty much the okay we're moving out motive. So after maybe four or five months, we had Lunar New Year's party and typically these drinking parties will go on all night and it usually ends up into a, a sort of mellow talk to each other in the living room gathering to the end of night sort of thing. It was probably 1am at this point and the people that were left were all in the living room at the base of the stairs. Everyone was pretty much accounted for. But as the night was dying down, everyone was chatting and suddenly we hear the doors, and maybe the windows too, start to slam shut upstairs one by one. This lasted maybe 10 seconds. It almost didn't sound real because, I don't know, it seemed like there were more doors and windows shutting than we even had. Silence, as we all stopped and stared at the top of the stairs, terrified. My dad and my brother started to walk up the stairs, and some of us crept behind them. They called out to see if anyone was up there, but there was no response. But here's the really scary part. Every single door was open. There wasn't a single door that was actually slammed shut at all. Yet we all heard the doors shut one after the other. I remember so vividly crying my eyes out when my uncle came back and said, All the doors are open. And after that, we moved out within the week. My parents never shared with me the address of that place. They never wanted me to look it up any further and I don't blame them to be honest. However, I'd really be interested in looking up more of the history of the house I guess. I've tried googling things such as Sam, Sacramento, Haunted House but I've never found anything. I remember what the house looks like but as extensively as I've tried to search it up I just can't find it. I'd be interested if anyone is able to find the house that I'm looking for and I'll give you a bit of a description of the house so that you guys can perhaps help me out. So it was a two-story white house, very symmetrically boxy I guess, big two-car garage, black gates that surrounded the house that opened up by sliding gates that led to the driveway in the garage, grass lawn with a decent sized tree. The backyard was pretty much cement and dead grass, 
It was located in the middle of the suburban street, i.e. not a corner house, not in a, a circle or court, just a regular drive street address between two other houses. And that's pretty much it. If you know of this place, or if you could find it, then I sure would be thankful and would love to hear from you. So I've had a few unsettling experiences in the woods, but this is unquestionably the strangest one. I've been mulling it over for years, and I still can't come up with a, a rational explanation. A few details have changed to protect my identity, but the story is 100% true. I can assure you of that. So, in 2018, my partner and I drove up to a national forest in Oregon for a day hike in early summer. The area was somewhat remote, but nothing too isolated. Hiking is huge in the Pacific Northwest, so there are plenty of other people on these trails at any given time, especially during peak season. Because of this, we chose a less popular trail in the hopes of getting some alone time. It was approximately a six mile out and back moderate difficult hike with a waterfall at the end. It followed a river and didn't intersect with any other trails. Simple enough, right? We were both experienced hikers in pretty good physical condition, so we had no reason to think that we needed anything but day packs with a couple of liters of water and some sandwiches. Getting back before dark should have been a piece of cake. So we set out sometime afternoon. At first we took it slow and meandered around the riverbank for a few minutes. I found a cool animal bone and we mused over what it might be. It was clearly a verbata from a large mammal, so we guessed it was probably a deer bone. Because I'm a little morbid and I like collecting things of that nature, I put it in my pack. That might not have anything to do with what happened next, but I feel like I should mention it since it was out of the ordinary. So, the hike to the waterfall was beautiful. We passed a few other people on their way back to the trailhead, but for the most part, we had the place to ourselves. We stopped a few times to look at wildlife or take photos of the flowers. I was tracking our progress on my Fitbit, so I always knew how many miles we traveled and how much time we had before sunset. We reached the waterfall at about 3.2 miles, which matched what the map had said. I paused my watch and we settled on a large boulder to rest and eat our lunch. Another young couple was there with their dog and we said hello and then minded our own business. But here was where everything went wrong. As we packed up our stuff and we prepared to leave, my partner Michael slipped off the boulder and twisted his ankle badly. The other couple heard his surprised scream as he splashed into the water, so they rushed over to help. The three of us hauled him back to dry land and assessed the injury. None of us were doctors, but we thought that it was a sprain. The swelling had already begun, and Michael said the pain was pretty serious. He could barely stand. Upon realizing this, the male half of the couple started backing away and seemed anxious to leave, I guess. I asked him if he could go get help, but he didn't respond. Neither did his wife. They both just turned around and started booking it up the trail with the dog trotting behind them. I called out to them in frustration, but they didn't look back. Needless to say, we didn't really have any cell service that deep in the woods, so we couldn't contact anyone else, which meant that we had to hike back. It'll be okay, I said to Michael. It's only three miles, and you can do this. We shifted the water bottles and our modest amount of gear into my pack, so we wouldn't have to carry anything and made decent progress. I was still tracking the hike on my Fitbit, and after about two miles, Michael ran out of steam and we rested again. I told him to lean on me to take the weight off of his injured ankle. Even though I'm a head shorter than him, it seemed to help, I guess, but we're almost there, I said. Just one more mile. Despite the setback, we were in pretty high spirits, though. The sun was still up and the woods were still beautiful. We made light of our predicament. Michael joked that he can't do anything without getting hurt or breaking something, and I comforted him. We both thought the ordeal was nearly over, and eventually I realized that we'd been walking longer than expected. I assumed that it only felt that way because we were moving at a slower pace, but when I checked my watch and saw that we'd gone farther than a mile, I started to worry a bit. We were at 6.6 .6 miles total, 
That meant that the walk back to the trailhead was longer than the walk to the waterfall. That couldn't be right. But I figured that I must have made a mistake at some point. Maybe I hadn't started the tracker until we already traveled a ways at the beginning or something. Regardless, the parking lot had to be around the next curve in the trail. But when we got there, it wasn't. When we went another half mile or so before stopping to assess the situation. Over seven total miles and we still weren't back. What the heck? I checked the map of our hike on the Fitbit app and saw that there weren't any gaps. It was a, a straight line from beginning to end with the line doubled back on itself, indicating that we were on the same route. But where was the trailhead? We talked it over and concluded that it had to be a glitch. Michael was adamant that we hadn't passed the trailhead yet and we couldn't have taken a wrong turn because, well, there were no other trails. Plus, the scenery was all familiar. But we saw things that we remembered passing on our way to the waterfall. It was definitely the same trail and well maintained too. A big wide dirt track that followed the river and didn't veer off into the undergrowth. Losing the trail was just impossible. At that point, we started to feel a bit demoralized, but what could we do except keep going? Our phones still didn't have service either. Michael was in a lot of pain and struggled to put weight onto his sprained ankle. It was twice the size of his other ankle now and he was sweating. I was sweating. The whole thing started to feel like a nightmare. When we went another mile and still didn't reach the trailhead, that was when we began to panic. Night falls quickly in the forest and we had little daylight left. We were almost out of water too, had no rain gear or other food and the only flashlights were the ones on our phones. Of course we cursed ourselves for not bringing more supplies but we were only supposed to be out there for a few hours. It was just short of a day hike and we had no idea how it could have gone so wrong like this. Out of desperation I yelled for help. We'd seen no people since that strange couple had abandoned us near the waterfall but I was sure that we had to be close to the parking lot. That didn't mean that there was anyone there but we were both so freaked out I was willing to make a fool of myself if it meant rescue. To our dismay, nobody answered though. We were completely alone, which was really strange. In an attempt to get a grip, I guess you could say, we reasoned that maybe we really had passed the trailhead that we started at. Maybe we were so focused on keeping Michael off his bad foot that we'd simply missed it and were hiking toward the next trailhead. We were pretty sure that that wasn't the case, but it was the only explanation that made sense. We were definitely still on the same trail and thought that we couldn't be certain, but it seemed like the landscape had changed. We no longer recognized any of the landmarks, except the river, and that seemed to support our theory that we'd gone too far. We knew that we weren't walking in circles, because that wasn't possible, but should we turn back? But we mulled that over for a few minutes. If we were wrong, backtracking would guarantee spending a night in the woods. Michael couldn't deal with that angle forever, so we decided to just press onward. I'm not crazy, right? I asked. That initial hike was only three miles. We went three miles to the waterfall. Yes, Michael agreed. The entire hike was supposed to be a little over six miles out and back. We've walked a lot farther than that now. We should have gotten back a long time ago. I don't understand what's happening. When night fell, we picked up the pace. Michael stopped leaning on me and limped down the trail as fast as he could. He later said that adrenaline dulled the pain of his injury and gave him the motivation to continue. Because that part of Oregon is mountain lion country and I just read about a lion attack a few weeks prior to our hike. Being caught out there in this dark was the absolute last thing that we wanted, but there was nothing that we could do about it. We were scared. Michael shone his phone light on the path ahead to make sure we didn't lose our footing, and I shone mine at the tree, scanning for cat eyes. I was crying. Fitbit said that we'd hiked nine total miles at this point. And after 9.5 miles, we finally saw the sign for the trailhead, and scrambled toward it. Relief didn't completely wash over me though because I expected that we'd have to either hitchhike back to where we started or trudge along the side of the road for a few miles more. 
There was simply no way that this could be the trailhead. It was three miles past where it should have been. As we climbed the short set of steps up to the parking lot, sweaty, thirsty, exhausted, and completely unnerved, I hoped to see my car, and my prayers were answered. But it was my car. We were at the same trailhead. For a moment, Michael and I just stared at each other in shock. Our fear and misery were replaced by just sheer confusion, and we just stood there. Then a twig snapped somewhere in the woods behind us and broke the spell. We hurried across the parking lot towards the car, and in those few seconds I felt something that I'd never felt before. Just an intense feeling of dread. The best way that I can describe it is the feeling you get in a nightmare when something is pursuing you and you're trying to run away but moving in slow motion. Like your legs just won't cooperate and you know the thing is chasing you is going to catch up. This is the only time in my life that I've ever felt that way outside of a dream. But we did manage to pile into the vehicle and we peeled out of there. I was shaking, Michael was rambling about time distortion and dehydration and how we must have lost our bearings somehow. We got out of the national forest and onto the highway and it was a while before we encountered any other cars. I didn't fully relax too until we made it back to civilization and neither of us can figure out exactly what we experienced that day. Michael was on crutches for months following that incident and his ankle has just never been the same since then. I still have the bone that I found too, but I keep it in a box because it gives me, I don't know, bad vibes I guess. When we go hiking these days, we stick to the crowded trails. Because whatever happened that day, we do not ever, ever want it to happen again. This is a first-hand account involving some strange phenomena that I have yet to be able to explain. I'm not from the area in which the strange things occurred, and I am curious to see if anyone else has had similar experiences or knows anything notable about the area. So, this starts on a Sunday in August 2013, after me and my pregnant wife had been to church that morning in Hopkinsville, Kentucky, when we decided to take a spontaneous road trip. We drove until we ended up in Paducah. Being impulsive, we decided against our initial range and hopped over to Illinois to explore the Shawnee National Forest. We had been driving for about 30 minutes through thick woods when the tree line broke and we came across a little standalone general store attached to a non-operational lodge. My wife and I, of course, had to stop. It was charming and old and though it didn't occur to us until later, something was a little off. In the back of the store area, there was a separate unlit room for very old looking things. There were odds and ends you'd expect to see in a 19th century manner, as well as some very old white dresses for little girls, along with very old black and white photos of the little girls the dresses belonged to. I didn't touch anything and the only thing my wife touched was something resembling a hand mirror, only in place of reflective glass was what looked to be a blackboard. We had a laugh at the strangeness of it and we moved on. Now, there was a wooden cutout with a cartoon pig painted on it, and as pigs were my wife's favourite animal, she wanted me to take her picture. I took out my iPhone camera and as soon as I moved the camera into position, the entire screen turned purple and the screen split horizontally for about half a second. I had never seen that happen. I tried to get the camera to recreate the glitch, which it did, but only pointing at the pig. I tried to capture a screenshot, but no luck. I couldn't get it to trigger again. I joked, ha ha, it's a ghost, and we kept moving on with our day. But no sooner had we pulled away in the car when she brought to my attention a faint scratch on her leg. I examined it closely, and I assured her that surely she had brushed up against something by the river earlier. As we moved through the forest, which was uncannily dark for midday, she told me that she had another scratch near the first one, which definitely had not been there a few minutes prior. She was freaked out by this, and while I was still dismissive, I was starting to become unsettled. This happened again as well. We crossed the ferry back to Kentucky, in a bit of a panic at this point, 
I pulled over and stared at her leg and watched until three adamantly sloppy X's had faded into existence from nothing onto her leg. Now, we had just seen The Conjuring in theaters a few weeks prior and remembered hearing that demons use threes as a mocking of the Holy Trinity. While it was just some faint, oddly formed scratches, we were pretty scared by them, I must admit. But the weirdest thing is that... I can attest that these things came from nothing, with seemingly no cause. In fact, I watched them form on her leg, when there was really no explanation for it. The last of which was a right angle, totally unnatural looking as well. This occurred in Pope County, Illinois, and the store in question is the Bay City General Store. I'm not sure if it's related to these phenomena, but that was really the only place that we gotten out of the car after there and our stop there immediately preceded the start of the strangeness. And while I'm not a believer in the paranormal, nor am I a denier, but I know that what we saw and experienced that day was 100% real and honestly without reasonable explanation. If anyone has been through anything similar or knows of anything unnatural that's happened in this area, then please do let me know because this one has me stumped. I used to live in a home that was old. This house backed up to the woods, lake, and other places to explore as a little kid. Everything was there for a kid. Anything you could ask for, really. But there was one thing that bothered me the most. The secret door in my room. I'm going to try and uh, paint a picture for you so you can get the gist of it. But there was a white picket fence that you would walk into. After opening the door, you would head into the main entrance. Looking inside the house from the main door, you would see a staircase that was going upstairs in front of you. Walking upstairs and there would be the split, left to right, guest room 1, bathroom, guest room 2, and guest room 3. I grew up in the third room. Inside this room it was stained wood everywhere. Ceiling, wall, and floor. There were two windows. Everything creaked and made a sound. And after some time, you knew exactly where not to walk making sound. One thing in this room though really bothered me. You see, there was a closet with shelves. You had to open this door to see it. Under the bottom, there was a, a loose fitting board. And if you moved it, there was a hole. Inside the hole was a crawl space and a lot of it. Apparently, the parents found notes inside the crawl space too and told me nothing about it until I was older. They just said, we found notes. But this always creeps me out just thinking about it. And this is because when I was younger, I would always feel my bed shake. In fact, I hardly slept because my bed was shaking all the time. All I could think about was the door in my room. And keep in mind too that this whole room was wood everywhere. It was the only room that was like this in the house and I would have these dreams as well. Horrible dreams. One night I would have a dream of the door opening and I was lifted off the bed. There was a black cloud and red eyes watching me. This cloud would bring me outside my room. I would try to run down the stairs but was thrown back up the stairs and it was all in slow motion. Once I would wake up, the bed was shaking and I was always in a weird position. Mind you, not from me shaking the bed. The bed itself seemed to be shaking. It was a wooden bed and it was shaking in a wooden room so you can imagine the sounds of the squeaking and it was a horrible sound. And this happened over and over. And to this day, I don't like talking about it. I don't really believe in ghosts, I guess you could say, but I always think back to this moment, and whenever I do, I always question everything. Whatever was in that room and whatever was happening, it was weird, and I just got the sense that something didn't want me there. To be honest, I'm just glad to be out of it. When I was in high school, I lived in an apartment complex in Calabasas, California. It's where all the kids live that weren't filthy rich that went to Calabasas High School or Agora High School. I became friends with most of the kids in that complex too. We would play basketball some days and on the weekends break into empty apartments and throw parties. One particular party that I was hanging out with a group I didn't know well, 
It was five other guys and one girl. We were smoking, drinking, and I saw the guys go into another room while the girl was standing in the kitchen drinking a beer. I get up to use the bathroom and I overhear the guy say, we're going to get this girl. Another guy says, we're going to run a train on her. Now, in high school, I was already a pretty big kid, 6'3 and 250 pounds. When I heard the things that they were planning on doing to her, I walked up to them and said, you guys aren't going to do a thing like that while I'm around. They tried to convince me to join in. It would be fun, they said, and she might get into it. I left the room and told the girl and said that she should probably head home, the party's over. She left and I left shortly after too. I never did have anything else to do with those guys after that. But the kicker is that the boy that said let's run a train on her, I later found out from a mutual friend, had actually murdered his girlfriend in college and was killed in a police chase crashing his car in the median. The world is a, a scary place, especially for women sometimes, and I think about this even more now that I have my own daughter. So this happened on my 19th birthday. I was living in Vermont on a mountain away from home as a working student on a massive horse breeding farm. It was February and obviously very snowy. We left a multiple day out of state event in the evening to head back to the farm. I was driving my own car with the new sales rep as a passenger. We're both women and she was maybe 25 or so. The other working students were riding with the boss in the big rig or with another who was driving a van. We convoyed with everyone else until about 12am when the trailer had an issue near Albany, New York. We had encountered snowfall all night as there was a blizzard going on but it was now getting bad around this time and area. The boss told me and the sales rep to keep going so that we could make it back for the morning chores in case they didn't. The barn manager was the only one who stayed back at the farm we knew that she slept like a sloth on tranks and was expecting to have the day off since we all would be back by then. Everyone else stayed so that there was enough hands to unload the horses if needed. So around 3am, me and the sales rep reached the back roads to get up the mountain to the farm. At this point, there was about 4 inches on the roads. But we kept having trouble getting up the hills and tried every route that we could think of. I didn't have a lot of gas left and we were tired and getting nervous as well. The sales rep suggested another route that she knew and I figured, why not? I'd never been this way of course because I would simply drive the same way down the mountain to go to town on my day off. And we got pretty far with this other road but snow was still falling and I was having trouble with the hill again. At this time, we saw a house, extremely far and few between in that area and I was able to pull into the bottom of the driveway. It looked like they had a truck up there and there was a light in a window, so we decided that we should knock and ask them if they could drive us to the farm. And I know that this sounds totally nuts, but everyone knows the farm and the boss had been there forever and seemed to know everyone personally. Plus, we were together, so we figured that it would be okay and it would hopefully be a nice man who knew our boss. And of course... This is where things get weird. You see, as we're walking up, suddenly a dog starts viciously barking and lunging at the end of a very short heavy chain which is attached to a tree, in a blizzard of all times, at night. This startled us and obviously we didn't like it on ethical levels, but the house was only a few yards away now so we sprinted to it. We got to the door and right as the sales rep is about to knock, I grab her hand because, now that we're close up and not chatting or dealing with this scary dog, I notice the door is only a piece of plywood on hinges, and the little house is terrible looking, like a, a shack if anything. Basically, it looked like they had built their own permanent shelter but didn't have the skills to do it nicely. But meanwhile, the dog is still barking and lunging on the chain, she sees what I see though and we decide to back away and then ended up running to the car because it was just one of those redneck properties that you imagine wouldn't appreciate visitors. It snapped us back into our senses that there could be multiple men inside or someone dangerous, especially considering the dog situation. And thankfully, I managed to drive up that hill that was giving me trouble before and 
as we get going, we see a, a herd of mini horses run across the road in a sort of line and jump into the woods. Maybe not the best considering what had just happened, but that if we found a farm along this road, it could be their horses and they'd be grateful for our help catching them and drive us home. Not long after, we came to a well-kept little farm and the road was a dead end right after. The sun was starting to come up now and we leave the car on the road and walk up to the house which isn't set far back at all. We knock endlessly but to no answers. And just as we started to walk back to the car, the sales rep spots something running up the road. It is that same dog. We run like heck to the car and got in just in time for the dog to jump around the outside of my car, biting the mirrors and whatever it could get a hold of, like it was deranged. To be clear, I love dogs. We live with the manager's pit bull, in fact, and I've now been working with dogs in many settings, including shelters for years. I've even had bad bites before and have worked with court-declared dangerous dogs, but I have never, ever seen one in person as aggressive as this before or after. In any case, we got the heck out of there and I drove as fast as I safely could away from this dog. But we didn't see anything else on the road or glancing down the driveway of that shack driving past it again. But when we got stuck on the next hill, we simply parked at the end of another driveway and sat there. My gas light was on and we were using the battery to run the heat now. We were completely delirious, just laughing and crying while keeping on the lookout for this dog or a crazy man. And eventually, around 6.30 in the morning, we saw a plow truck coming and got out to flag it down. He knew our boss and gladly plowed our way home, which we were very thankful for. But looking back on the whole thing, the situation was really strange. I mean, that dog was on a heavy chain and... There's just no way that it could have gotten loose without somebody letting it go. I really do believe that someone sicked that dog on us because it was just impossible for it to get out like that. Plus, we were almost a mile up the road when it got to us. We had also been watching the mirrors as we left the shack because we were so freaked out already. Whether they thought that we were going to break in or were just mad that someone came up the driveway or something else, I guess I'll never know. I'm just glad that it was an almost creepy encounter with whoever lived in that decrepit mountain shack. So this is going to be kind of lengthy, but I really want to share all of this with somebody else. I'm still really uncomfortable thinking back to some of this stuff that happened to me there, and to this day, it really eats at me. Anyway, in 2011, my family moved into this house that was built in the 70s. I was only maybe 9 at the time, and before this really didn't have any reason to believe in the paranormal. The first thing that I noticed was just strange sounds happening at night. There would occasionally be either bells ringing, like sleigh bells kind of, and or an old rotary phone ringing. We didn't have a phone like that hooked up, so it always gave me the creeps. The weirder stuff eventually started happening though. One of the first real encounters occurred when my mum returned from the grocery store one day. She had pulled her car into the garage and had already closed the garage door and went inside. I was minding my own business, bouncing a ball, when I saw the shadow of what looked like a, a little boy walking right in front of me and into the house. As it happened, I yelled, Hey, wait, I can see you. But he didn't respond or come back. When I was younger, the idea of some invisible kid was a lot more cool than spooky for some reason. I eventually got my little brother to come with me to investigate the garage because I wanted to know more about this strange shadow boy that I saw. I recall knocking on the closet door in the garage because I figured that that's where he was staying. I remember asking, can you come out? And my brother asking similar questions. I eventually asked, did you miss your mummy? And the door came creeping open. We both freaked out at that because whatever it was, it definitely responded. There was no way that that door should have moved. I ran to go to get my mum because I wanted to show her the ghost boy. Of course, she didn't believe us though. I tried to ask him the same question again to show my mum, but the door didn't budge this time. 
After that, more strange things began to unfold as well. One of my favorite toys up and vanished, and then a very strange looking spoon that looked like none of the ones that we owned appeared in the kitchen, almost as if some kind of a, a trade or something. And as a kid, I was not happy about that. I loved my toy and I didn't want that spoon. There was one time at night as well that I heard my brother scream from the living room and when I came in he said that he heard the refrigerator open. I called him a chicken but when I went to check it, it was actually wide open. And we were the only ones awake at the time. I really don't think that he was lying as well. There was another time as well one night while I was doing my homework in the kitchen and I heard my old pogo stick bouncing up and down in the garage. From where I was sitting I could see into the window door of the garage and it was pitch black. And I know for a fact that it couldn't have been my brothers because we were at this point scared of the garage so there was no way that they were just in there in the dark of all things. But what makes it even more interesting is the pogo stick in there was one that I got off the neighbor. It was probably as old as the house. Things started off kind of innocent as well, but they got more hectic as I started hitting puberty. It was nighttime once again and the sleigh bell noises were happening all the time. I went to go to get my brothers and asked them to come into my room because I was scared. But we all sat there and I asked if they could hear it. They sat, eyes wide and terrified because they could definitely hear it too. I remember another night laying in bed, I heard my dog growling and barking from my mum's room. I got up to see what it could be, but when I got there, I saw him staring into my mum's pitch black bathroom. The door was slightly cracked open when I got there, and just pure dread and terror went through me, and I bolted back to my room. It was around this time too that I was starting to have terrible night terrors and insomnia because of my fear of what was in our house. I would constantly wake up from nightmares where I would die or other stuff. It would always be jumping off a building or dying in a car crash or something terrible. And this went on for months and months, maybe even years. But then finally, something happens that was my breaking point. You see, I was trying to get to sleep because it was a school night, but I was struggling because I wasn't tired. And I remember being struck out of nowhere with just fear. I felt it deep in my core like something was just going to get me, like eyes were on me. My heart started racing so fast and I didn't know why. But then, suddenly, I heard loud whispering. It sounded like hundreds of voices all muddled together and... I couldn't believe it and sat in shock for a moment just trying to figure out what they were saying. I eventually cried out please go away and put my fingers in my ears. But the sound, it didn't even muffle. And after that, I immediately turned on my lamp. And the noise just stopped. I just sat there, tears rolling down my face, wondering if maybe, maybe I had hallucinated all of that. In any case, I stopped sleeping in my room after that. When I started sleeping in the living room, it sadly only continued to get worse. But we had this huge family picture of me and my brothers hanging in there, and one day I had come to find that it had scratches all over it. But the scratches, they were only on my face. I don't know, but I feel like it was some kind of a warning maybe. The living room was debatably more terrifying at night. The sleigh bell noises would always be there. Whenever I moved or made a noise, it would stop as if it was scared of me or something. But we had this huge mirror above the couch that I slept on and... Yep, you know where this is going. We had lived in the house for a couple of years at this point and it had never ever budged. But one morning I woke up to this thunderous bang noise and... The mirror above me came down nearly hitting me right on the head. The thing was maybe 200 pounds or so. It might have actually just killed me had I been even a few inches closer to it. I screamed and cried after it happened, wondering why it happened in the first place. I don't know why, but whatever that thing in our house was, it really didn't like me. Perhaps because I had given it more attention than anyone else had. Maybe because 
I had grown to be afraid of him or it. I often wonder if it didn't hate me but rather wanted me to be dead as well so that it could have a friend or something. I know that after everything that has happened it's easy to slap a label on this entity and call it evil but deep down I, I don't know I really wonder if maybe it was just lonely. Some years later the paranormal stuff had died down for the most part though but there were two other occurrences that I think are worth sharing. So one day I had opened the door to the garage to get something, only to see the closet door wide open. I stared at it for a moment in confusion, only for it to slam shut super hard. I sort of yelped at that and I ran back out. And finally, the last and probably the craziest thing that's ever happened. I mentioned earlier how there was this old rotary phone noise that happened occasionally at night. Well, I hadn't heard it in years at this point, but this one night while I was sitting on the couch drawing, I heard it again, and it was the loudest that I'd ever heard it. It sounded like it was only a few feet away from me, so I just sort of sat there frozen, scared, waiting for it to stop. But it kept getting louder and louder until finally a huge orb of light flashed a few feet in front of me and then just disappeared. I whipped out my phone and I started recording immediately, and I wish that I had gotten that light itself on the camera, but I did get the ringing noise. The thing about this ringing too is that when I covered my ears, it didn't muffle, just like the whispering, and when I recorded it, it was on the video, solid and real, and well, we moved out shortly after that. And so, that concludes my story for the most part. Interestingly enough as well, right after moving out, I actually stopped having any insomnia. And I know that this next part is just totally in my head, but I've even had a few nightmares where I'm back in that house trapped in the closet that's in the garage, not able to get out. And I wonder if that's what this thing may have felt like. I feel like whatever or whoever he was once upon a time was and still is sad and very angry. Back in 2015, I was dog-sitting for a family that my parents knew really well. They lived in a wealthier neighborhood and had three dogs. It was a very safe area too, so my parents were okay with me doing it, even though I was still in high school. They had contractors working on the deck outside and I was notified of this by the homeowners and they told me that the guys would never have a reason to come inside the house so I shouldn't have any concerns about interacting with them. So, one evening I returned to the house after school and cheer practice. I walked through the threshold and down the hallway into the kitchen in the back of the house to let the dogs outside and there was literally a man just standing there staring at me. None of the lights were on. I almost had a heart attack, in fact. I flipped the light switch on, and it looked like it was one of the contractors. He was smiling, too, like a, a complete psychopath. He held up the spare key from outside and said, You're staying here all alone, right? You should have hidden this key better. The key was hidden in the front of the house under a rock. And not only that, but it was a very hidden rock in the back of the garden hidden under a bush and the contractors they were working in the back of the house there was absolutely no reason for them to have found that key which tells me that this guy had been purposely looking for it i told him to leave immediately or i would call the cops as he walked by me to get out of there he whispered to me the cops wouldn't do much it wasn't breaking and entering then he handed me back the spare key. I immediately called the homeowners and they were obviously freaked out on my behalf. They called the contracting company to fire them and wanted to know the name of the exact guy who was entering their home. And it turns out that this dude wasn't even actually a part of the contracting company. The whole team that was at the house every day was at that moment with their boss at dinner. Which means that some random dude was watching the house, found out that I was there alone, pretended to be one of the contractors, and broke in just to mess with me. 
thank God that my father came and spent the night with me, and thank God that this creep didn't do anything worse. To this day, we still have no idea who he was or how he found that key. I'm fairly confident too that he didn't try anything because once I came through that door, the owner's largest dog, a Labradoodle, came downstairs. The creep obviously didn't know this, but that dog was extremely timid and shy. The reason that he didn't come down when the guy entered was because he was probably hiding and felt comfortable to come down once he heard my voice. I think that the presence of that big dog may have scared him that day, and I think that I may have just gotten really, really lucky. This is a, a story as told by my dad. My dad was a younger teenager at the time and was riding on the bus in Chicago. A man got on and sat in the seat across the aisles from him. He turned toward him and started to strike up some conversation. My dad says that the hairs on the back of his neck raised and he got a seriously creepy vibe from this guy. Gacy was all smiles and charm and asking my dad increasingly personal questions. Luckily, before things got too personal or creepy, my dad's stop came up and he enthusiastically noped off the bus and pretty much forgot about it at that point. It wasn't until years later, 1978, the year that I was born, that he saw on the news that same creepy guy, affectionately known by children as Pogo the Clown and Patches the Clown. Apparently, he had a thing for teenage boys. But here's another creepy detail. My dad is best friends with a guy who happened to live across the street from Gacy as a child teenager. He confirms that Gacy was a really creepy dude. He also confirmed that his parents observed the police and forensics go to work on Gacy's basement and painstakingly remove 26 teenage boys from the crawl space. Sweet home Chicago. Am I right? So I'm going to tell you guys a story that happened when I was 17. This story, it still freaks me out so much and I don't even know what happened that day. I would like to have your opinion on it if that's alright. It was in November and my friend Jacob was going to have his 17th birthday. Me being a good friend, I proposed to have him sleep at my house and then go for a walk the next day with friends in the forest. He accepts, everything goes well. He sleeps at my place and the next day we leave with friends for two hours off the road. The forest is a bit far but at the time I lived in the city centre so it took a little while. But after the road I quickly realised that I forgot the keys to my house at home and that therefore the door to my house was not locked. But hey I tell myself, we are in town and only a few people frequent the suburbs anyway, it should be fine. The day is going well and it's time to go home and I was stressed out about knowing if my house had been robbed or not. But in the end I just said to myself that there was basically no chance of that happening. My friend Jacob wanted to spend more time with me before I left for my studies and so we did that. And in the end he decided that he was going to sleep over my place. We walk into my house and I see that it's all intact. It's pretty nice looking and wide open so I walk around the house and... That was when I noticed something. The cellar door, which I never open, was open. And there was white paper on the floor. I quickly realized that we had to call the police and check if there was anybody in this house to reassure us that there wasn't. Myself and Jacob, perhaps stupidly as well, decided to shout out that if the stranger didn't come out that the police would take care of it. To be honest, I was paralyzed with fear and... I was scared that the stranger was actually going to come out. And the bad news was that we suddenly heard the stranger, who was in that cellar, cry out, You're not allowed in this home. Get out of here before I lock you up. Jacob immediately got scared and asked me to come and see if the police were outside. Luckily, the police were there, and so they came inside. There was a bit of a scuffle at some point. And they took this guy in the car and took him away. 
But the creepiest thing is that the police actually found kitchen knives, an axe, iron chains, and a board. And there was also a white sheet on which was written behind you, down in that cellar. Obviously, I didn't know this at the time, but I spoke to the police later and they told me that the individual had apparently run away from an asylum not too far away. Today, I'm 25 and these days, I always check to see whether or not I have the house keys on me or not. Back in my single days, uh, I often tried online dating apps. I talked with well, lots of guys, but this one guy in particular, his name was Tom, we started chatting after we matched up and it went well. So we progressed to talking over the phone. He had a nice voice and I liked that he could carry a conversation because I always feel sort of awkward with talking to people and I have the problem of running out of things to say really. My mind will draw pretty much a complete blank when I'm nervous as well, so having him talking to me on the other end of the phone was a nice relief. After some successful phone conversations, we went on a couple of dates in person too that were surprisingly very pleasant. We met up in public venues, a couple of restaurants, we both had a background in English and he was also a writer like me, so it was nice to have these interests in common. Our conversations were easy, in depth with a pretty nice flow. I invited him to a function in my community where he introduced himself to my neighbors, friends, and even my family. They kind of looked at me questioningly like, is this your new boyfriend? Raising their eyebrows. I told them no, that we were just friends who were still getting to know each other. It felt too, I don't know, soon for me to call him my boyfriend, I guess. But Tom said something different telling everyone that I was, in fact, his girlfriend. I had to keep correcting him, and I felt a, a little bit embarrassed, if I'm being honest, and I regretted bringing him to the gathering in the first place. Overall, we really only uh, dated, I guess you could call it, I use the term loosely though, for about three weeks before things started to get, well, really weird. You see, Tom was increasing his number of text messages and wanting to spend a lot more time with me, asking to see me almost every single day, in fact. At first, I, I thought that this was flattering. I enjoyed the attention and the feeling of being wanted. But at some point, I'm not exactly sure when as well, it just escalated to a, a really different, uncomfortable level. I remember just feeling smothered. He'd blow up on my phone asking me what I was doing, but it didn't seem like he was asking in a normal how are you kind of way. There was a, a controlling undertone to the question. When I answered, he'd want to know every detail about where I was, what I was doing, what time I was doing it. I considered that maybe he was just feeling insecure and that he would calm down with some time. On our next outing, I actually met up with him and my friend so we could go out to a bar and just hang out. At some point though, my friend wanted to leave because she wasn't feeling good. We said goodbye to Tom and I left the bar to take her home. When I checked my phone after arriving home late that same night, I saw that I had a bunch of angry text messages from Tom about why didn't you kiss me goodbye and things like, you don't really like me, do you? I wrote back saying, I just had to take my friend home, I didn't know I was supposed to kiss you. Kissing me shouldn't be an obligation, he wrote. Sorry, I just didn't know about it because I was occupied. We can let this go, right? I'm tired and I want to go to bed now. He said, okay, you're right, I'm sorry. Please don't ghost me, okay? Or something along those lines. I didn't know why, but I just felt really weird and that he was just too clingy. And it worsened from here. But moving forward, whenever I talked to him... It seemed like he would be deliberately trying to initiate an argument or a fight. I am definitely not the confrontational type and so this was incredibly energy draining for me to keep up with. But why does everything have to be an argument? I confronted him one day. He explained how he grew up in an abusive household and he was used to the members of his family fighting and arguing all the time. This apparently felt normal to him. I explained 
well, I'm not used to this, and frankly, it feels a, a little scary to me. People in my family talk things out calmly when we have disagreements. We don't raise our voices, jump to accusations, or have temper tantrums. You're right, he said. But of course, this didn't change. I lost the spark at this point, too. That initial attraction I had for Tom was just gone. Truthfully, I actually felt pretty repelled by him now. I decided that I just couldn't see him anymore. I felt really sad and guilty for his life situation and the way that he grew up, but at the same time, the roller coaster dynamic of our communication was really starting to take a toll on my own mental health. And unfortunately, when I broke up with him, he threatened to end it all. I didn't know what to do, so I asked my parents and some of my old psychology course classmates for advice. And everyone advised me that Tom's mental instability wasn't my responsibility and that he needed to go and seek help. He kept flooding me with messages on all of my accounts though. As mentioned before, he was a writer so he'd send beautifully written lengthy pleas for forgiveness and I replied with, I really just need a break right now, but he ignored my wishes and would keep trying and at one point he even sent a photo of his dog telling me his dog says, hi I miss you and... That's when I thought, okay, this is weird and manipulative, so I'm going to block him. And I did. I blocked him on everything. Phone numbers, social media accounts, everything. But when he couldn't reach me, he even resorted to some drastic measures. He even emailed my parents. Yeah, my parents. Why is he messaging us, my parents asked me. This feels weird and creepy. I don't know, I said honestly. He's pleading us to convince you to get back with him. I don't want to be involved with this, my mum said. I don't want you to be involved either, I said. My parents knew the whole ordeal already because I had asked for their advice when he had threatened to end it all. So while having a discussion about it, our consensus was to offer no response. They proceeded to block him as well and next it was my friend who had gone with us to the bar. Uh, Tom is messaging me, saying that you broke his heart or something, she informed me. What happened? Did you do something to him? I broke up with him, just don't respond. Block him, I said, and she obliged. But unfortunately, even that wasn't the end of it. Then Tom reached out to my neighbours. I guess he remembered their names or something at the community function and memorised them all by heart or something. He reached out to one of them with a lengthy, elaborate story about how we had been together for at least six months and that we were passionately and madly in love. In this story, he portrayed himself as some kind of a victim, like I was the villainess, a man-eater, or something weird. I don't know, because I didn't read it. What did you do to this poor guy? I kept being asked over and over again by different neighbors. I was forced to keep repeating an explanation about what had happened, we only went out for a few weeks, I said, a month at most. I advised them to please not respond or encourage him. Honestly, I'm a very private person, so having my whole community know about my situation was deeply humiliating for me. This went on too for about a year. I'd have someone tell me Tom tried to reach out to me again. There was even one older lady, a neighbor of mine, that actually continued talking to Tom over email, even though I asked her to stop. She said, but he writes so beautifully and he's a beautiful dark soul. The whole thing put a rift between her and her husband, so that was a thing as well. A separate neighbor told me that she was afraid for my personal safety, because she said, he seems like a stalker type, like from those crime shows, which obviously didn't do much to help my anxiety. I spent a lot of time indoors for a while after that too. I felt withdrawn, insecure, deeply embarrassed, and most of all, I felt scared. I felt like I had to look over my shoulder whenever I stepped outside of my home. I took a long break from dating apps, feeling a bit shaken from the whole experience after that. Two years later, in 2018, he texted me from a different phone number saying, you know who this is? If you still don't want me back, don't respond and I'll leave you alone forever. Even though he didn't give me his name, I just knew that it was Tom. Frankly though, I was relieved. 
my first inclination was to think, I'm finally free. And thankfully, he hasn't messaged me, my friends, parents, or neighbors again since that time. And boy, do I just hope that it stays that way. So, a little bit of background about me and my roommate in this story. We were both practicing Christians, so I do believe in the spiritual side, demons and such. But I had never had any encounters that I deemed supernatural per se. But that all changed for me about three years ago. We were living in a small apartment at the time where me and my roommate, his name was Joe, lived at the time. His girlfriend had just gotten back from a mission trip to Haiti and brought home a gift for him. This gift was a crudely sort of wooden carved elephant that she was gifted from a Haitian child. This thing was really sort of creepy, I guess. It just gave off a really eerie vibe by looking at it. Clearly hand carved with not the best craftsmanship, it was unsettling to look at. However, Joe being a good boyfriend graciously accepted the gift. I somewhat jokingly, but also seriously, expressed how I did not like the mojo surrounding this thing. He basically explained that he thought that it was weird, but it was a gift, so he was going to keep it. And at that, keep it in our room. Later that night, I received an unusual text from my neighbor who lived across the hall. We were friends, but we never really texted, so this struck me as odd when she asked, Are you okay? I was in the living room watching a movie at the time, so I replied, Yeah, just relaxing, watching TV. I was met with the response of, Oh, I had just pulled in and thought that I saw you in your room pacing back and forth. My heart dropped instantly. Uh, I was home alone at that time, and so I immediately ran into the room to find nothing but stillness. I made a glance at the wood-carved monstrosity, which almost felt as if it was staring back, and then closed the door. Now unsettled, but not completely startled, uh, I tried to settle back in. A couple of hours later, it was time for bed, but this time my roommate had already returned. I told him about the text, but he mainly brushed it off. I've never been a great sleeper at the best of times too, so this experience didn't help me to get into a state of rest. However, eventually, my mind drifted asleep. But this sleep did not last long. Now, what I remember is that a feeling that I had never felt before came over me. My eyes felt as if they were glued open and I didn't even notice myself blinking. My body was all of a sudden strapped to the bed, not able to move even an appendage. All I had control over were my eyes and I immediately looked to my roommate across the room who is dead asleep with all my might trying to let out anything from my mouth, but I couldn't even get out a whimper. My eyes then looked to the front of my bed to see a sight that gripped me with absolute curling fear, an imposing outline of nothing but blackness, so black that it stood out amongst the rest of the darkness. There was no face, no true shape, just the vague structure of a humanoid creature that looked as if it was a void absorbing darkness and growing even blacker by the second. I moved my eyes up to try and avoid this thing, but it was so tall it was hard not to see it. Then it felt as if my chest was being crushed. Looking down at the pressure of my chest, it now appeared that the thing was coming over me. It wasn't crawling over my bed, but actually levitating closer and closer to me, until I was forced to stare at nothing but the void before me. What I presumed to be this creature's face, I guess. There was no emotion, no noise, no nothing, just complete darkness. And when I think back to this, that's what churns my stomach the most. The lack of anything is... Something I, I'd never experienced before. I don't remember the thing leaving or me falling asleep. I just all of a sudden woke up in the morning, naturally thinking that my mind had just dreamt up a terrible nightmare and I was still pretty shaken. However, when I looked to the floor of the room and saw that wood-carved creature had fallen off its shelf and rolled a solid three feet to the foot of my bed, I felt ill from the fear. I immediately decided in my own mind that the events must be connected. I have never suffered from sleep paralysis before or after this event. We got rid of the wooden elephant and then blessed each of the rooms of the house and after that we 
had no issues until we moved out. I truly believe as well that this wood carved object had something attached to it or at least something to do with what happened. I'm not very informed on the subject but it was of a Haitian descent so my first thought was maybe voodoo or something. This is my only ever encounter of this type of thing so please do let me know if you have any information or opinions on similar stories. Thanks for listening to my story, it's uh, good to get it off my chest. When I turned nine, my parents finally let me start walking to school. It wasn't far and even though they were worried, I assured them that I would be fine. I was so excited because my best friend lived next door and that meant that we could walk to school and back together pretty much every day. Things were going great as well the first few weeks. We had so much fun laughing and talking all the way to school and back home. There was a liquor store along the way that we would stop at on the way home too to get some snacks and candies, but only on a Friday. It was like our little treat and the thing that we looked forward to at the end of the week. One Friday afternoon after school, we began our walk to the liquor store, talking about school as usual. It was just like any other time that we went to the store. We would rush in laughing all the way to the candy, pick our favorites, and hop in line to pay. This time though, there was a man with a pack of beer and... He looked like he worked in construction or something. He was in the line before us with another man, but when he saw us, he let us go first. But we thought that he was just being nice, so we happily obliged, and as I talked to the cashier, my friend stayed behind me, and I could hear the two men behind us speaking in Spanish, I think, and laughing, so I turn around to look and see my friend with a really nervous look on her face. She grabbed my arm hard after I paid and practically pulled me out of the store. I kept asking her what was wrong and she said that she didn't feel safe and we should just run home. I was confused and I wanted us to enjoy our candy on the way back like we always did until she told me what she'd heard. I don't speak Spanish but she did and apparently the two men were talking about me. She said that one of them pointed to me and said she looks like the one. They both laughed and agreed and the one with the beer said, let's follow them and we can grab her around the corner. She's small and won't put up a fight. I froze in fear. We were still in the parking lot of the store and didn't know what to do. We looked around us and saw the two men get into a big work truck. They didn't even glance our way so I told my friend that they were probably just joking and we were being paranoid for being scared. But... Boy, was I wrong. My friend didn't agree with me and said that they were definitely serious and we should start running. I was hesitant at first until I turned around and the truck was right behind us. I took one look at my friend and we grabbed hands and ran as fast as we could. Our hearts were racing and we didn't dare turn around. We were both crying and I ended up dropping our bag of candy we turned around the corner and there was the truck again, and my heart dropped. The man in the passenger seat actually hopped out as well and began to approach us. He didn't say a word. His eyes were locked on me. I've never been that terrified in my life. I was frozen in fear. My friend, however, started yelling at the man in Spanish and he seemed to get angry. There was a busy road to the left of us and it was our only way out. We knew what we had to do without even having to say it. We didn't look left or right, we just ran for our lives across the traffic. A car almost ended up hitting us as well, but they slammed on their brakes at the last second and started honking. We just kept running until we were about a block from our houses. We were out of breath and hysterical, we thought that we had made it, but when we heard a whistle and we look and it's that same truck again, the men were on the other side of the street, windows down, whistling at us. We had no option but to run as fast as we could to our house. My mum was in the front gardening and she was shocked to see us running and screaming like that. We couldn't get the words out right but all we managed to say was that a truck was following us. She immediately ran to the street to see the truck peel away. As soon as she calmed us down she called the cops to take a report but nothing never came of it and I was never allowed to walk to school ever again.
Growing up in a Mexican household, my mum and I never really had the best relationship. I was nine when it happened and I was getting bullied at school and home was no better because we were poor and I was getting yelled at a lot for being lazy. I didn't talk much as a kid too. I didn't think I had anything interesting to say or that anybody really cared about what I thought to be honest. This would be the first time that I try to talk to anyone about something that terrified me and absolutely nobody believed me. So we used to live in a, a two-room trailer. My family was a family of six, including me, my three siblings and two parents. Uh, my sister and I had a small room to ourselves. My brothers would take the other room and our parents would sleep in the living room, the dining or kitchen. Note too that I'm the oldest of four and usually that meant that I had more responsibilities than my siblings, also taking into account that I'm a female. My siblings and I though were walking home from school one Friday. I remember it being a hot day and when we got there we did the usual routine, turn on the TV to watch some PBS kids, wait for mum to cook dinner or make sandwiches, take a nap, etc. I remember I was watching TV when my mum suddenly gets between the TV and I and starts screaming at me for some reason. I don't really remember what she was yelling at me about. I just remember she was infuriated with me. My siblings went to their rooms while my mum grabbed me by the shoulders and just yelled. I cried and I was getting angry too. I remember screaming at her through my tears when out of nowhere she just slapped me. And I slapped her back but not as hard as she did me. To this day I regret it. I've asked for forgiveness to her and have never ever done that in my life again. But we were both taken aback at what had just happened. She started to cry too and I could tell that she was stressed out. I just couldn't understand though why or what was causing it. I ran to my room crying and lay down on my bed, drowning out my screams in my pillow and my sister left the room to watch TV. Eventually I fell asleep, well cried myself to sleep really. It was a good sleep too. One moment it's the afternoon, all hell was breaking loose and the next I open my eyes and it's just pitch black. But the thing is is that I didn't just wake up on my own. I felt like something pulled the blanket that was on me. I shrugged it off and uncovered myself thinking that maybe I was just having another one of those dreams where you feel like you're falling and you jolt awake sort of thing. But also, it was very hot that night, and so, well, maybe I kicked the blankets off. But when I uncovered myself from the blanket, though, the room felt so fresh. I saw my sister in her bed on the other side of the room, and I tried going back to sleep. Not a minute goes by, though, when something takes a hold of my foot and pulled me down like it was trying to drag me under the bed. I immediately sit up and I see a black hand firmly gripping my foot. I can still feel it sometimes and that image is forever burned into my head, but I panicked and I yanked my foot away from its grip. I stay sitting down on my bed, breathing heavily, trying to process what the heck just happened. Was it real? Did it actually happen? Yes, I could still feel the remnants of its grip around my foot. I tried leaning over the side of the bed. I wanted to run, but I didn't want it to grab me as soon as I step on the floor. I prepared myself and I bolted out of the room into my mum's room. I felt really bad and guilty about leaving my sister behind, but I was a kid and I was scared. I woke up my mum and told her what happened. She replied with, okay, go back to sleep. And I did as she said. Well, I tried to anyway. I slept at the end of the bed by her feet that night and I tried my hardest to go back to sleep. Eventually sleep did take over but it was really restless that night. The next morning my mum asked me why I was sleeping in her bed that night. I told her what happened again and well obviously she didn't believe me. She said that I was just imagining things and that it was my guilty conscience because of the way that I behaved the day before. And after that, I just learned to keep quiet about it. Since that day, though, I have never slept with my feet uncovered. I don't care if I'm roasting like a chicken under those blankets and getting crispy. 
I will not be taken. I had also acquired a, a deep fear of dark since then, and I will absolutely not sleep without some kind of light on. I learned it the hard way too. Because, you see, well, a couple of years ago I accidentally went to sleep in the dark, and for the first time ever, I experienced sleep paralysis. As the years have gone by, I've experienced a lot of weird things like this, but those stories are for another time. What I can say with certainty is that I've never felt alone, I guess. It's like it keeps following me, or it wants something. This thing has watched me grow, I guess, has watched me suffer, cry, laugh, and even sleep. Has anybody else ever experienced something like this? I've yet to talk to someone who has, and this is also why I don't think anyone ever believes me. I mean, to be honest, why would they? So I've been through some, some pretty scary experiences, but this was the worst thing that I feel that I've ever gone through in my life. You see, I used to be a very naive, innocent kind of person. I was the type of optimist who believed that there was a touch of goodness in every heart. A dangerous mindset to be in, I know. I realize now that seeing the world through my rose-colored glasses put a big flashing red target on my back. Often, when you think of scary stories too involving creepy behavior and psychological abuse, you think of a, an occurrence from a stranger, I guess. In my case, it came from my mother-in-law. My husband's mother initially adored me, but not for any reason other than thinking that I could be easily controlled, I guess. I was meek with a passive personality, so it made sense that I would come across like someone who could be easily influenced. Looking back on it, I cringe at how creepy the situation really was. For the sake of this story though, I'll call my mother-in-law by the name of Mrs. Psycho. So at the beginning of my relationship with my husband, Mrs. Psycho and I were getting along pretty well. Well, so I thought at least. She'd take me shopping, give me compliments about my hair and girly stuff like that. As the relationship with my partner grew more serious, she would rant and rave to everyone in our neighborhood about how much she adored me and how I was like the daughter she never had. So naturally, I really thought that things were progressing positively. But certain things were just really off about Mrs. Psycho. I noticed little tidbits of her behavior at parties and neighborhood social gatherings. She'd sulk in a corner, for instance, and I'd chuck it up to her just being socially awkward or anxious. But looking back at it now, I noticed that she was always whimpering about something negative going on in her life. How she fell off her bike and hurt her elbow while riding through a construction zone. How one neighbor complained about her parking in front of his house or something. Her losing her job because she didn't get along with a co-worker. The list really just went on and on. In every story, she portrayed herself as a victim of some unusual circumstances. One huge red flag, though, that my mind didn't understand at the time was the story she would always tell me about her other son, my partner's brother. She'd say some really disturbing things about how he'd held her and my partner and his dad hostage in their own home and how he'd physically punched their father in the face. The way that she described the story made it sound like my partner's brother was a bully to the whole family, and my partner didn't seem to think that it was quite as severe as she made it sound. Regardless, in all of her wild stories and accusations about him, she always scolded her son in ways that I just can't imagine ever scolding my own child. What my husband and I didn't fully interpret at the time was the underlying problem, which wasn't necessarily his brother but the woman who had been a driving force for the insanity behind the behavior. Psychological abuse can trigger emotional responses in very unpredictable and even disturbing ways at times. Mrs. Psycho's behavior became evidently creepy after our engagement, though. She showed signs of unhealthy enmeshment. First, she was angry that we didn't tell her immediately when we'd gotten engaged. Then she was angry when we changed the wedding date without first asking for her permission. She expressed a desire for my future husband and I to live in the upstairs of her house and pay for rent. 
We told her that we can afford our own home and we want to start a family, so that wouldn't work out. The infuriation in her eyes was frightening to say the least. She would look normal one moment, then if you told her something she didn't want to hear, her eyes would turn like black. The memory of her eyes really still sends a frightening chill down my spine too. From there, she became increasingly controlling as well. Mrs. Psycho and her husband, Mr. Psycho, would start showing up to our house every other day or so. I started counting how long they could go without having to see us, in fact, and that number came to a mere three days. There was no privacy, and I felt like I had to close the curtains over our windows every night. I just had that uneasy feeling, you know. I locked the bedroom door as routine before bed, just to be on the extra safe side as well. So despite our relationship being pleasant in the beginning, I noticed now that I was feeling like I was treading on eggshells around Mrs. Psycho, or perhaps rather, landmines even. It seemed like anything that I said was offensive to her, no matter how innocent. I realized that I couldn't talk to her like I used to be able to when me and her son were just dating. I remembered when we'd been able to have nice in-depth conversations and I had allowed myself to be vulnerable with her. I confided in her about how I had a lot of social anxiety and that her son came into my life during a time that I was suffering from crippling depression. I talked about how he'd brought a ray of sunshine into my life, thinking that speaking kindly about her son would please her, but she just had this unfeeling sort of glazed look across her face. Hoping to mend my relationship with her, I decided to help her out one day with organizing her antiques. She had this hobby of going to auctions and buying and selling knickknacks, buttons, and stuff like that. She would get very proud of her collections of things that I sort of thought were junk, but to be polite, I told her that I saw beauty in these things, hoping to get back on her good side. There were some creepy dolls in the mix, including this horrifying looking vampire doll with piercing red eyes. She said that she had that doll for years and used to scare her sons with it or something when they were little kids. She laughed at the memory and the sound had an eerie satanical vibe to it. As if this wasn't enough too to freak me out. She then told me that this story about a female co-worker complaining about her to the HR department at her company and to seek revenge on this woman, Mrs. Psycho wrote a letter that was meant for the co-worker's husband telling him that she was cheating on him. To remain as anonymous as possible, she told me how she clipped on a, a pair of black gloves and drove the letter to a faraway location that her address couldn't be traced. I remember feeling very uneasy about that story, wondering how she could get angry enough to drive hours away just to cause emotional harm to another human being. There came a point after hearing this story too when I just didn't want to be left alone with my partner's mum anymore. My partner tried to talk to his parents about how I was feeling like I was on eggshells around them, but they flipped the narrative to say that they were the ones feeling on eggshells around me. During this time, I painstakingly realized that psychological torture exists in the form of extreme invalidation. Not having your feelings acknowledged can really drive a person crazy. It was then when I felt a little more clued in as to what may have happened to Mrs. Psycho's other son. I can't be sure because I never met the guy, but I think that he was driven mad by his mother's severe emotional neglect. Now, she was pulling the same tricks on me and my partner, gaslighting us into believing that we were just too sensitive. When my husband and I started figuring out that something was off, things got even creepier though. You see, his parents started showing up to our house to corner us into submission, what I mean is that they'd tell us stories to make them feel like victims so that we would give in to the demands of what they wanted at the time. If we denied their requests, they'd use psychological manipulation by telling us that we were uncaring or ungrateful. One demonstration of this manipulation was when I became pregnant. I explained that the smell of pizza made me extremely sick at the time, but this was ignored. And when Mrs. Psycho insisted that we go to a pizza restaurant for her birthday... I was confused with why I felt like I couldn't say no. My husband was in the same predicament. Somehow, I think we sensed that something bad would happen to us if we declined. This is also because Mrs. Psycho's husband and her sister had contacted us 
telling us explicitly that we weren't allowed to say no to her dinner invitations anymore. They explained it like saying no hurts her feelings, but there was something else there that I just couldn't quite explain, I guess. Something hidden beneath the surface that sounded really threatening. I had no idea why, but I just didn't feel safe. And then, only two weeks after giving birth to our daughter, I had the creepiest interaction of my life. Mrs. Psycho caught me alone while I was on the front porch one day. The weather was really nice, so I was rocking with my baby in one of the outdoor chairs. She came to the doorstep and assumed a seat in a chair next to me. Then, in a really ominous voice, she said to me, You have to share her, you know. Her black eyes flicked to the infant in my arms. And I know what you might be thinking, but this wasn't said in a cute, sort of excited, new grandma kind of way. Her voice sounded cold and possessive, with certain passive-aggressive intent behind the statement. I naturally clutched my arms around my daughter tighter, feeling a protective instinct take over me. Mrs. Psycho had expressed to me before that she'd always wanted to have a daughter, but was only ever able to have sons. Maybe I was being influenced by the postpartum hormones or just overall feeling paranoid, but a disturbing thought occurred to me that she might want to get rid of me somehow to have my daughter to herself. I later told my husband about the bizarre interaction with his mum and how I just couldn't keep up with the heavy psychological demands of his parents anymore. It was all taking a strange emotional toll on me as well as a strain on our marriage, and I still couldn't pinpoint exactly why. Nevertheless, they were causing us a lot of stress which was impacted on me all the more while I was trying to adapt to my role as a mother as well. They even restricted me in really bizarre ways, telling me that I was no longer allowed to refer to our daughter as my baby. I had previously posted on Facebook about how excited and happy I was to be a new mom, and I posted a side-by-side -side picture of me with my daughter with the caption, She has my eyes, which was meant to be a light-hearted and innocent expression, I guess, but my mother-in-law commented on the post with, My son had something to do with it too, you know. Which not only put a damper on the mood, but also felt creepy again. Like, why did she have to mention something we already know? It was almost as if my happiness made her more enraged or something. I really felt like I was starting to go crazy. The stress was enough to make me physically sick as well. At first, my husband hesitated when I told him about my concerns, stating the usual spiel that was natural for him to say, that they were his parents and that he couldn't just drop contact with them. But something in his voice contained fear and... It wouldn't take long before he would realize just how messed up the situation actually was. And the incident that drove him to the point of cutting off his parents happened when they cornered us in our own living room, demanding that we watch their unruly dog while they went on vacation for five days. My husband almost caved, but stayed firm when he told them, no, we can't, we have a two-month-old baby to look after. The murderous glare in his own mum then flashed at me, and it was intense, and enough to make my skin crawl. You know that look someone gives you before they're about to attack? It looks something like that from the movies. Very primal and extremely hateful. I thought for sure that she was about to lunge at me and wring out her hands around my neck, causing me death by strangulation. I was terrified. But Mr. and Mrs. Psycho eventually left our house and... They were clearly angry that they weren't able to convince us to conform to their will. My husband and I had a dark, suspicious feeling that something bad was about to happen too. First, we received lengthy emails from Mrs. Psycho, mostly insulting me. She said she thought that I was brainwashing her son and she went on to portray herself as a victim. She used the knowledge of my anxiety disorder to make an argument that I was mentally unstable and dangerous. She threatened to post about me on Facebook and make our life a living hell if we didn't apologize for deviating from what she wanted. At the same time, she told me that I was dead to her and listed all the mistakes I have ever made in the past as well as criticizing my faults. I'd be lying if I said that this didn't sting as well. My husband and I needed space to recover from the emotional wounds that she had inflicted on us. We remained silent in all of this, not wanting to engage with her any further. 
My husband and I were pretty scared as well as being hurt, spending most of our days cooped up in our bedroom, not knowing what to expect. But we stayed strong through the process of separating from toxic relationship. And Mrs. Psycho, though, proceeded to make good on her threat, posting about me publicly on Facebook. She said that I was crazy and she even went a step further saying that I had borderline personality disorder, in all capital letters mind you. This came out of completely nowhere as well. She knew that I had anxiety but I had never mentioned anything to her about being borderline or anything because I wasn't diagnosed with that at all. But it didn't end there though. She also posted a dramatic story of how we had banned her from seeing her grandchild. An active smear campaign against me ensued as Mr. and Mrs. Psycho actually went door to door to everyone's house in my community, posing as good citizens to warn everyone about their extremely dangerous, manipulative, five foot tall daughter-in-law. Thankfully, my neighbors didn't react the way that they expected though. They were more wary of her than of me in fact, and instead of ruining my reputation, which was the desired effect, most people in my neighborhood were majorly creeped out by Mrs. Psycho's efforts. They were equally creeped out by Mr. Psycho's willingness to go along with the whole thing. I can only guess though that after years of being beaten down with his wife's abuse that he was just an empty shell of a man, a flying monkey to the proverbial wicked witch. There were a few doctors and therapists in my neighborhood who couldn't officially diagnose her because she wasn't their patient but... They said that off the record that they believed Mrs. Psycho may have been projecting, meaning that she was, in essence, confessing that she is potentially dangerous and volatile while pinning it on me. This, uh, along with some stories of Mrs. Psycho's interactions with other people in the neighborhood, confirmed that something was disturbingly off with this lady. And this information made the situation all the more unsettling when Mr. and Mrs. Psycho showed up to our house for what we suspected would be a confrontation. My husband and I were watching Survivor in the living room with our baby when suddenly the doorbell rang. He crept to the front window to peer behind the curtain to see who it was and I could see the fear on his face. It's my parents, he said, and my blood ran cold. I immediately ran with my baby upstairs, pausing only to tell him that it was his choice whether to answer the door or not since they're his parents, but that me and the baby would be hidden away. As I made my way up the stairs, my husband hovered by the front door, conflicted. He didn't know what to do. Meanwhile, I could hear jostling at the front door like his parents were trying to now force their way inside of our house with a spare key. I thank God to this day that we had just changed the locks a few days before so they couldn't get in. I proceeded to run upstairs and close the bedroom door behind me, locking me and the baby inside. I held my daughter close, my heart thudding wildly against my chest. When there was a knock on the bedroom door, I reacted with a jolt. It scared me, but my husband's voice on the other side calmed me down, and he told me that he didn't answer the door. He was trembling when I unlocked the door to let him in. His face was pale. He showed me a text message from his dad saying, anyone home, followed by another text from his mother saying, you're a coward hiding behind your keyboard. Now, to this day, I don't know what would have happened if my husband had have chosen to answer the door that day, but really, I shudder to think about it. My husband and I both blocked them after that, phone numbers, social media accounts, everything in fact, and they moved away to another state, thank God. We have since had no contact with his parents for almost two years now and our daughter is growing in a loving environment, free of any of that sort of toxicity. Sadly, we've had to block some of my husband's other family because they were telling us that we should talk to my in-laws, which, by the way, feels a lot like being told, please contact your abuser. For this reason, I sometimes feel like it would have almost been better to be physically abused than mentally abused because then there would be some form of visible evidence of the harm that they had inflicted. In the meantime, they've so far made no attempts to contact us with an apology or anything really. Instead, they once reached out with a nasty, have a terrible anniversary, you two are a match made in hell. 
which only further secured our decision to cut contact with them. I have since armed myself with knowledge so that I will be less naive about creepy behavior in the future. I've studied up on narcissism and the negative psychological impact that some people can have on others through gaslighting and invalidation and things like that. I do hope though that everyone out there listening may be aware that not all abuse is physical. So, to preface, I would just like to state that this story is probably going to sound a lot like a, a plot of a campy 1980s horror movie, and is going to be pretty long as well. However, the entire story is true, and if not for being five miles from cell reception, and the way the story ends, there would be a police report for verification. I'll be changing names, locations, and some details in order to protect the privacy of the innocent as well. So, a buddy of mine and I try to camp twice a month now that I have a vehicle that can be trusted to get me to some of the more remote areas of our state. We planned a camping trip for the past weekend and we chose a fairly remote location that we had been to the previous weekend as well. The previous weekend, we were the only people that we'd seen within a one mile of our camp spot. Friday night, we got there and we set up. This story takes place on Saturday night. It's about 9pm so the sun is long gone and the moon hasn't quite risen yet. It's pitch black out other than what our fire lights up. When suddenly we hear a man just screaming. We listen intently, silently sharing an anxious look. At first we were hoping that it was just someone drunk and having a little too much fun but it quickly becomes obvious that this isn't fun party screaming. It isn't even like he's hurt. It sounds like full of despair, anger, and anguish. I'm going to take a moment here to remind you too that this is at 9pm, pitch black night, in the middle of nowhere, woods, five miles from the nearest cell phone signal, and we hadn't seen anyone in hours. The screaming continues though for what felt like hours, but was probably about five solid minutes, I would guess. We had no idea what to make of it, and started feeling extremely paranoid. We gathered up everything remotely close to a weapon and tried to come up with explanations of the screaming while keeping our eyes on the forest around us. After about 15 tense minutes of fear-induced paranoia, I nearly fell out of my seat as I watched a flashlight and lantern slowly enter our camp. I greeted the stranger with a basic how's it going before he was even lit up by the fire. He responded quickly but flatly by asking if we could do him a favor. That depends on the favor, my buddy and I said in unison, obviously tense, holding our weapons close to us. The stranger proceeded to ask if he could hang out for a second by the fire. Given the two of us, one of him, plus our myriad of weapons gathered from around the camp to within our arm's reach, we decided to agree to let him hang out. After a short second of awkward silence, I ask him what the heck is going on. He proceeds to tell me and my buddy that he was camping down the trail with his buddy and that his buddy had snapped and tried to kill him. Wait, what? I said before the thought even finished processing in my head. Is that the screaming that we heard earlier? The man slowly nods, staring blankly into the fire and begins his story. We were just hanging out, man, and... We came up earlier today and, well, my buddy just freaked out. He started screaming and screaming and just wouldn't stop. Then he attacked me. He lunged at me and I told him to just back off and chill and, you know, well, he kept coming after me and started getting pretty violent and I'm pretty sure he was going to kill me, so I grabbed my car keys, the lights, and I ran. I don't know what to do, man. He chased me when I ran and I don't know what to do. We don't have firearms or anything, but we do have a hatchet. My buddy and I looked at each other for a second, completely astonished. Then, something horrible dawned on me. Wait, he chased you? Like, he's on his way here, right now? The man just slowly nods in reply, and right on cue, like some terrible horror movie come to life, we hear screaming from maybe 30 to 40 feet from our camp, down on the main trail. Whoever it was said, I just want your balance, Gary. I want your balance, Gary. Gary, where are you, Gary? And 
I had never in my life heard a man scream like this. I've never heard anything like it in my life, in fact. It was a brutal, guttural scream that was shrill to the ears, yet deep in pitch. The sound of someone gone completely mad. And the way that he said the stranger's name would switch erratically from long and sing-songy to short, guttural punches of sound. We killed our lights, became silent, and listened. And by some miracle, the madman didn't notice our camp and continued walking down the trail, screaming the whole way. We ended up chatting with who we'll call Gary for hours, listening to the screaming getting further and further away. Come to find out that they had taken four, maybe five grams of magic mushrooms each, and his buddy, who we'll call Ty, was a co-worker of his and was fined for three and a half hours, and then just suddenly snapped. It seemed as though Ty thought that he could kill Gary and steal his good trip or something, we hear the screams get further and further for over two hours. By this time, it's 11 p.m. The moon is starting to come out and it's below 30 degrees. Ty had no jacket or flashlight, according to Gary. My buddy and I are way too drunk to drive out of camp to get cell service as it was snowy and icy and required two to three miles of highway driving from getting off the trail. And Gary was lightly feeling the effects of weed and mushrooms, so he couldn't drive either. But we had to make the decision to let the guy wander, hope that he sobered up and could find his way back. And he did. Oh, he did. Right into our camp, in fact. But we hear yelling after about an hour of no screams, maybe 30 to 50 feet from camp again. Hey, help, please help me, I'm lost, and we can tell the man's walking from the woods into our camp. We tell Gary to hide just in case and greet the man with me carrying my 12 gauge shotgun and my 40 cal pistol holstered, my buddy carrying his AK-47 style rifle with his two 9mm glocks holstered, and with our flashlights on our brighter settings in his face. He was 6263 and maybe about 300 pounds. We talked to him and decided that he was calm enough to walk with and walked him back to his camp. He seemed really remorseful, I guess, said that he blacked out and didn't remember anything, and had a, a falling out with his buddy. We escorted him back to his camp down the trail, returned and told Gary that Ty seemed well, cool now, I guess, and if anything else happened to scream and come running, that we would come out and help him if he needed it. In the end, it ended up a, a pretty happy ending. We made friends with Gary and I got his phone number to make sure the next day that he got back into town safely, back to his wife and kid, and we're actually planning a camping trip with him soon. But Ty, who wandered screaming like a deranged maniac into the forest, potentially wielding a hatchet to murder your friend to steal his good trip or whatever it was that his psychosis-filled mind was thinking, we will never be seeing him ever again. This happened four years ago when my boyfriend and I were still sort of fresh into the relationship. My sister had recommended me a, a snorkeling trip for a fun thing to do with him. It was this quarry surrounded by a campground that is filled with water and it's known for its crystal clear water and its diving as well. There's apparently a helicopter and a school bus that people dive down to see or something. Anyway, my boyfriend and I decided to go camping for the night. While we were checking in, we separately both got a bad feeling about the place, but had kept it to ourselves until after we left. So at first, it was a really good time, really. We snorkeled in the shallowish area of the quarry, and although the depth of the water was a bit uncanny, I still was enjoying myself. But the water is 65 feet deep, so once you had swam out of the shallow area, it immediately dropped off and it was pitch black. This is actually where I realized too that I'm pretty terrified of water this deep. But besides the dark deep water while we were swimming though, there's something very scary about a lake that is perfectly still like this. I assume because it's a quarry the water doesn't have a current, but my boyfriend and I are winding down our night and we're back at our campsite. We're camping in a sort of grassy patch down a hill from the road. Our tent is pitched in a wooded area that our campsite is extended to and just across the green is a campsite that looks well lived in but our neighbours were out. 
We're making hot dogs over the fire when our neighbors get back. It's night time now and they immediately go to sleep. I'd say 20 to 30 minutes after they got back is when things started to become really weird. You see, my boyfriend and I were chatting when we noticed a dark figure watching us from the hill. But because of the shadow of the fire, we could not actually make out the characteristics of the figure, but we knew that he was staring directly at us, almost sort of hiding behind our neighbor's truck. He had watched us for what felt like forever until he started walking down the road again. We both watched him in dead silence, watching him walk behind the trees, the same ones that connected to our campsite but that also went in between us and him. I anticipated each time that I'd see him walk forward, out from behind a tree. It was a good four or five that he came out from, but it wasn't until after this that I noticed that he had stopped walking, or he was behind the tree, still. I was totally freaked out, I mean, where did he go, right? I watched my boyfriend looking at what happened and thinking the same thing, but he had shrugged it off and I naively did too. We actually ended up forgetting about it and went to the quarry last night. It was beautiful seeing the stars reflected against the water, but the deep, now all-black water was terrifying to say the least. We walked back to our campsite, lined in our tent and smoked a joint. And it was around this time that I soon began to feel a, an uneasy feeling, which I was trying to ignore, telling myself it's because I was high. But after some silence between us, my boyfriend says to me, do you feel like we're being watched? And I said, why would you say that? Half joking, but full serious that I was scared. My boyfriend wanted to get out from the tent, so well, we're standing by my car and I got this stupid idea that being in the middle of the field that's in the middle of the campground is the safest place for us. My logic being that if someone was going to come up at us, at least we'd be able to see them. So, we're in the middle of this field when we see a similar looking shadow figure from earlier staring at us. He must have been about 20 yards away, I would guess. We both notice him while walking and he's walking in the same direction as us. We change directions and so does he. We tell one another that if we change again and he does too, that we're booking it to my car. And when we change, he follows and we immediately book it to the car. I watched him from my seat as he slowly walked back into the darkness while still staring in our direction. My boyfriend at this time says to me, let's get out of here, and I agree, but all of our camping gear is outside. So we quietly get our things together, not trying to freak the other one out. But the weirdest part of this story, in my opinion, is the next part. You see, my headlights weren't working, and there was a weird fog over my windshield that didn't go away no matter what we did. We had to drive out of the woods with only low beams and a really strange sort of fog material over the window. In fact, we barely could see, but eventually we got out of there and, weirdly enough, the fog went away right as soon as we got to the gas station. We got home around one at night, I told my father the story the next day, and he said that he was glad that we got out of there or else maybe we could have gotten murdered. Apparently, two people have died in that campground while snorkeling, which I only found out after I got back. My boyfriend and I think that it was probably a person trying to kill us or maybe it was a, a wendigo or something. We're not completely sure what happened, but whatever it was, it was completely unexplainable to us. I mean, the light's not working all of a sudden, the weird fog thing over our front screen. The whole thing was uh, something that I'll never forget. So, to cut a, a long story short, we have a cabin that is pretty remote. It's where I stay for work. I'm always told not to go alone for safety reasons, as it is very remote. Things can go wrong quickly and help is pretty far away if that is the case. This trip though, I went alone as I needed to get work done there. I also needed time to get away from the city life. Getting out into the wild is a great way to reset and I don't know, I just needed that. 
My trip ended up taking a long time. I got into the camp at about 1.30 in the morning. I stopped the truck, put on the headlamp, went straight to the warehouse to get the generator going. I connected the power, the cabin lights are up. There was a ton of snowfall, so I do my usual inspection to see if I can spot any tracks around the cabin. Wolf tracks, moose tracks, or human tracks. And I find nothing. I head into the cabin, light a fire, and cook myself a late meal. As I said, it's pretty remote, and there isn't any cell service, but I did download some movies on my phone to keep me occupied. It helps me fall asleep. I did eventually fall asleep too, but at about 2.30 in the morning, and I decided to add more logs to the fire to make sure it lasts through the cold winter night. As I was doing this, though, I noticed that I heard someone or something walking on the deck towards the front door. You know that sound when snow is being crunched by a boot? That's what I was hearing. I thought, weird, I haven't heard a vehicle pull in or anything. So I listen just to be sure that I'm actually hearing this correctly. But then, I'm 100% sure that there is somebody outside. I get up from the chair where I was sitting and then immediately look at the window, then move to the front door to unlock it, then I look towards where I was hearing these footsteps from. I call out to see if anybody was there, but nothing. I uh, thought to myself, well, whatever it is, it wants fear and there's no way that I'm giving it that. I close the door and lock it to be sure. I stayed up for a while longer to listen, but there was nothing. I thought to myself, or well, maybe a marten, which are common critters around these parts. So I fall asleep, and the next morning I check for tracks, and there were prints. There were some, but I couldn't confirm that it was mine, or if maybe it was somebody else's. To be honest, I had forgotten to check the moment that I got up, and I would walked by there a few times that morning to use the bathroom, so they could have been mine, but... Then again, they, they did look a little different. I have gone back there with company as I usually do. I, I stay up a little later than everyone else to listen for those footsteps these days. But I, I've never heard them again. Where I'm from, legend states that when alone in the wilderness, something will play tricks on you and you're not supposed to respond as its goal is to bring harm to you. I don't know about all that, but it was a creepy night and something that still bugs me.